You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. This month's Center Steer podcast is sponsored by Commonwealth Classics. Commonwealth Classics is a direct importer of classic vehicles from Europe and South America and has a rotating collection of rare and unique Land Rovers. Their showroom is located in Virginia, just 45 minutes from Washington, D.C. Visit www.cwclassics.com to view their current inventory of classic vehicles. This episode is also brought to you by LT Wright Knives. These heirloom quality pieces will outlast your adventures, so plan well, drive safely, and carry an LTWK. Find out more online at ltwrightknives.com. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. Welcome to the Center Steer Podcast, the first Land Rover podcast on the planet. Center Steer is a podcast by Ford about Land Rover owners. This is show number 71 for February 2019. I'm your host, John Costage, here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Going to let you know we're under a high wind warning for the day. And while we're recording this, you probably, listeners, not notice it, but it's very possible that I could lose power or internet at any time. And so you might just hear a little a, a, a glitch, but you might not. I don't know. Hopefully everything's just fine. We've had a a lot of uh, rain in the Pittsburgh area, the most rain we've ever recorded in the Pittsburgh area last year. And when you get uh, high winds coming in, it could knock down trees much easier than normal. So that's why I'm giving you that little heads up. Uh, joining me. Also not a good day to go driving around in a 101 FC or a vintage <laughs> meat, meat wagon or anything high profile and boxy like that. I, and, and absolutely correct. They said that on the news last night. They're like, if you're out on the turnpike, especially, you might want to be careful in a, in a high profile vehicle. It's like, yep, with you there, because it'll probably blow the vehicle around. Uh, uh, that, dear listeners, is Harold, also calling us in via uh, calling to us via Skype. Hi, Harold. All right, hunkering down under the winds here, hopefully <laughs> up up on uh, Latrobe Mountain. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> and uh, joining us from the windswept state of Vermont is Morgan. How's it going? <laughs> Fortunately, we've only got just a little bit of rain. That's it. Not so much wind. How's how's your snow been this year? Uh, it's actually been decent. We've gotten a yeah. couple of snowstorms that really dumped on us, which has been kind of nice. I was in uh, Quebec after the main winter romp, and I think they said it's going to be a record snowfall. Thankfully, while I was there, uh, there was no additional snow. But my informal measurement was about five feet of snow on the ground. Yeah, those Impressive. pictures you showed, the pictures you had looked more like the snow on top of the building was taller than the building it was on top of. Uh, yes. There were, while I was there, there were a lot of people out on their roofs trying to clear the snow uh, to get it off the roof. And then I uh, didn't get some of these pictures, but there were, they, you know, they know how to clean and clear snow up there because they've got these giant machines that go down the side of the road right up against the the guide rail the guardrail and they are giant snow blowers so they're these you know big uh, augers are pulling the snow in and snow and pushing it well they also have small slightly smaller ones that they are in town and so you'll drive down the road and then you'll you won't see the house because there's so much snow <laughs> in front of the house <laughs> it's like a giant wall <laughs> in front of the house uh, yeah they, they pretty, pretty much plow the roads with a tunnel boring machine yeah exactly exactly Unfortunately, Michael, uh, in the windswept state of South Carolina, is not able to join us today. He has some family issues. I'm sure he will join us again shortly, or soon, I suppose. Our guest this month is Deborah Neim. She's a two-time Rebel Rally champion, uh, competitor, and she has been driving an LR4. So we look forward to talking with her later in the program. A uh, number of thank yous this month to hand out or say or talk about. First, to our Patreon patrons, especially to Charles from Alabama and Dan from Victoria in Australia. Two new Patreon supporters. Thank you, gentlemen. Really appreciate it. Your support really does help us, especially with our domain management website hosting. And if you wish to become a Patreon supporter, go to patreon.com slash centersteer. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N for all the details. And you can become a Patreon patron yourself. Uh, next up, uh, Rovator, our friend of the show, is donating $80 uh, to the podcast for the purchase of one of his Range Rover Classic winch trays. 
The trays are $480 plus shipping. Uh, there will be a link to those trays in the show notes. There is actually already a link to the to the uh, trays in the show notes. And so if you're in the market for a Range Rover Classic winch tray, go ahead and check out Abel's uh, winch trays. And you can also help out the podcast at the same time. Thanks, Abel, for your uh, offer and also your generosity. And Abel was at a uh, secondhand revival presented by Roundabout in California. Thanks to him, uh, he not only sold one winch tray, but he also got an outright donation. So first up, he, he actually sold a winch tray to Gus Seifert. Anybody know who that is? He actually is a known person. Well, he, he's known to somebody, but not me. He is the uh, bass yeah, He is the bass guitarist for Roger, Roger Waters Band. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> hey, it's someone someone more famous than us, certainly. Uh, he well, re- that doesn't take much. No, it does not. So Abel tells me that uh, Gus drives a 1970s white two-door classic, and Gus in the past was a hardcore off-road driver, heavily modifying his uh, past discoveries in Range Rovers. He's still hardcore, but wants to respect the classic look of his Range Rover Classic, so he was super happy with the idea of a winch tray where he gets to keep the classic look of his classic. Uh, Gus was even happier when he learned that he didn't have to modify the suspension for heavy duty bumper and he was also happy to learn that his purchase would help the center steer podcast so thanks very much gus yeah that's awesome very nice oh and, and we want to see some pictures when that gets all sorted out send us uh, send us a photo and also at the secondhand revival presented by roundabout show uh, abel was talking with marcus hunt marcus owns a 1997 defender 90 marcus happily donated 100 dollars when he found out the podcast was in need of a new microphone and marcus's defender has been in his family for his entire lifetime owned by his father so whom after many years of patiently asking and waiting was able to have after his parents retired out of state he was able to get the truck back and even within the family it's hard to let go of a landy so thank you, Marcus. The podcast online store is uh, is up and running still uh, and continues to be up and running. So if you wish to show your support for the podcast with a T-shirt or a sticker, uh, head over to the website and click on shop. Thanks for your comments, follows, likes on Twitter, Instagram, email, Facebook. I think that was uh, all the ones I saw. I have three to read to you today that we had listener feedback. Three is the number, and the number is three. Or is it four? Maybe it's four. First, I was at, of course, as I said, it was at the Main Winter Rump this year and this month, and I talked with a, a number of current and potential listeners, and specifically a shout-out to Barry and Jassy. I had a couple beers at the bar And that was nice. We had a good time talking about our trucks. This is from a listener in a new location we have not heard from before. So this is the first confirmed listener. You guys already know this. The Island of Barbados. So Alex says, I want to thank you. I want to say thanks for doing what you do. I am uh, late to the show, but this means I get to start from episode one. And uh, and make my way up to the present. Just letting you know you have an avid listener in Barbados. I'm currently rebuilding two Series 3 88-inch lightweights into one vehicle. One of those was the first car I drove when I got my driver's license at 16. I managed to find it again and convince the owner to give it back to me. You understand why. It was not too hard to convince him. Uh, If you take a look at my progress here, and he has a link to, there's a lightweight uh, form, and of course we'll have a link, I'll include that in the show notes, so you can go out and take a look and see at his progress yourself. He continues, I'll be doing the exact opposite of winterizing this vehicle. I'm toying with the idea of using the heater vents and pipes to circulate cool air into the footwell areas. It's a long road ahead, but I also um, am enjoying every minute of it. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Alex. Alex, you are a glutton for punishment. (laughs) And I'm not necessarily talking about the project. I might be referring to the notion of listening to every one of our episodes from number one forward. Take a, definitely take a look at his progress and see what he did to, uh, he's doing a, that's a lot of work and he, Oh yeah. It's an ambitious project, no matter how you stack it. Yeah. And he will, he's conversation with him. Uh, he will be doing the work while listening to the podcast. So probably when, when he hears this, he will probably actually be physically working on his vehicles. Very meta. Yeah. Don't drop anything, Alex. 
<laughs> Next up, from the uh, northern climb in uh, North America, OVLR, that's the Ottawa Valley Land Rover uh, Club, uh, Dixon. And Dixon, you're coming on the show. I know I've talked to you a couple times. You're coming on the show. I want you to talk about OVLR and also talk about the Land Rover owner's uh, uh, distribution list. And so you're coming to the show. But he had three comments from the last show. Number one, best way to winterize a chassis is to galvanize it. If not, then the rest of... If not, then the rest of your ideas. I've seen a couple people vent the sump and the valve cover vents into the chassis. Not sure of the success, though. Or don't drive it in the winter. <laughs> the salt in the northeast in Canada is a killer. Two, Mississauga ends with a GA sound, not a GUA sound. So that should be, I think I said Missis Mississauga, and it should be Mississauga. And three, you can import... It's still Mr. Saga's wife, though. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. That was a great title. I, I really enjoyed that one. You can import right-hand drive vehicles into Canada. However, because studies have found that, they are, that there are 30% more likely to get into an accident, Quebec no longer allows the registration of right-hand drive vehicles. Prince Edward Island does not allow them on the road unless they have, quote, right-hand drive vehicle, unquote, sign on the back. I think they no longer allow new registrations. I understand that much of this stems from the import of Japanese skylines and other hot hatches and the accidents that they have managed to incur. Mind you, I don't think that's related to the right-hand drive. I think it's related to the people who want to drive that kind of a vehicle. Yes, and regards from Canada, Dixon. And I think there's a big speed difference between that <laughs> and a Land Rover. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Especially, yes, especially a 1987 Land Rover Defender 110 traveling, hurtling down the, the 30 from Quebec City to Montreal. Yeah. Uh, well, and I got to meet Dixon at uh, British Invasion this summer when he was hanging out with Jim Macri. So it was great mm -hmm. to meet him then. Look forward to having him on the show, talking with all of us. Yes, indeed. Well, you, you know, I might suggest, since he's been the driving force behind the Ottawa Valley birthday party every year, that we should have him for our next birthday party. Oh, oh, that's a good idea. Oh, that's, that's a good time to have him on the show. I like that. And the final listener message comes from Chris Isles, and he's with the San Diego Land Rover Club. I recently found your podcast and love it. I found it on Brian's rag or er, uh, alloy and grit. <laughs> I think I said that right, uh, which I also love. So question <laughs> is the, so a little shout out to uh, alloy and grit uh, question is the only way to get back issues on in on the website. Since uh, I, I did message him about this, but since he brought it up and others may have this question, I thought I'd bring it up here. Uh, you can you know listen to the show. All the back episodes of the of the show are available on our website. So if you want to take them with you. Uh, as you're traveling, like, uh, and I'll read this here in just a, in a minute. That's what he's doing. Uh, and you have a podcast app that you're using to listen listen to them, such as iTunes. I personally use Over Overcast. Uh, each of those are different in how they store or hold on to episodes. So you have to look at the settings in there. I know with Overcast, I can tell it to keep the past three episodes of a show, uh, download new ones and keep three. I can tell it to keep all of them. So you can do that. iTunes will, by default, I if you don't listen, if you download, you subscribe and you download five or six episodes and then you don't listen to any of those, iTunes will unsubscribe you. It'll just stop going out and, and uh, downloading them automatically. But I think it keeps them all as long as you have them in, in iTunes and don't remove them. So all as depends. long as you're doing your job and listening to our show, it won't be a problem then will it that is correct but if you're going but if you're starting from the beginning and you're and you're traveling and going on a trip and you're not going to have an internet connection to download them as you go uh, just be mindful of those different podcast apps and how they work. So it can sure. be done. Right. You could also download them uh, locally and and burn them to a, a a CD if you if you wanted to, or you know take it on a on a thumb drive or an SD card. I mean that certainly can be done too. We have no or restrictions just on that. Push them across onto an MP3 player if that's the way you roll. Exactly. Continuing on with Chris's message here. So he, uh, he's headed out to Death Valley uh, for a four day week 
four days of travel and with four other rovers and he needs some entertainment. So that was the hence his reason for his question. Um, the, the, so that same groups of peeps are also doing the contentment divide in June as, uh, as much off-road travel as possible. One of the guys did the TAT from West to East last fall in his discovery too. Uh, so they have set up a, an events uh, uh, blog that you can follow all that. And I'll have a link to it in the show notes, of course, so you can go check that out. Then he uh, concludes here specifically me. I have two rovers, a Series 2A88 and a D1XD. His wife wanted AC. He is the current president of the San Diego Land Rover Club as well. And they have a web page which is being converted. So it's under repair. So you can check them out on Facebook. So if you're, you can go out to uh, just type in San Diego Land Rover Club and join in on their Facebook page if you like. So thanks, Chris. Good to hear from you. And now time for the news. Not a good month for JLR uh, financially. <laughs> uh, so we'll st- starting with the, with the with the first article. JLR posts biggest quarterly loss of three point four billion pounds. And I'm going to read some of this uh, because uh, I just think it's interesting and to understand where 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 Land Rover is and where well JLR is. Some of this might also explain how I got there. Some doesn't. But anyway, uh, JLR announced its biggest quarterly loss on Thursday. Uh, this So this article came out at the beginning of February. After it was forced to take a £3.1 billion pound write down on the, on the value of its investments as Chinese demand slumped. Britain's largest car manufacturer, which is owned by Tata, uh, made a £3.4 billion pound pre-tax loss in the last three months of 2018 as sales, sales fell. It anticipates a loss for the financial year as a whole for the first time in a decade. Half of the 3.1 billion pound non-cash charge was taken after JLR accepted that previous investments in property and machinery were worth far less than previously thought. The other half was attributable to goodwill uh, impairments and accounting correction that recognizes that future earnings potential is likely to be diminished. So, So in other words, they were having the bean counter Olympics there. Yes. Further, car makers have been on the front line of economic pressures in the world's second largest economy as growth slows, with sales falling in China for the first time in almost three decades during 2018. So, and here's the nitty gritty JLR's retail sales in China, which account for about one in every seven of its cars sold worldwide, fell by 40% year on year during the quarter, overshadowing growth in the U.S. and British markets. So China fell 40% year-on-year during the quarter. Sales rose by a fifth year-on-year in the quarter in the U.S., and they were up by 18% in the U.K. And repeat that just so you're, you're, as you're driving or you're to see what's going, understand what's going on. Sales in the U.S. up, sales in the U.K. up, sales in China really, really down. The company uh, employs 18,500 manufacturing staff in the Midlands and Merseyside, and last month, they said they were going to cut 4,500 4, jobs in response to the challenges. The majority of the cuts are expected in UK management roles, costing the company £200 million. Pounds. On Thursday, Tata said there would be no further job losses at JLR beyond those already announced. So that was in The Guardian. And I think that was written in a little more standard English to understand. A little more on the financial side is an article from The Washington Post. Headline, JLR is headed for a cash crash. <laughs> Great, yeah, nice little title. As you know, uh, so JLR suffered a $4 billion pound loss this, uh, $4 billion loss this month. It was $3.1 billion, pounds, $4 billion. Credit investors need to start worrying about what's coming next. So I'll read some of this. Half of the value of the write-down comes out of tangible assets, a- tangible assets, which now won't generate the value the company previously thought due to weak market conditions in China, technology disruptions, and rising debt costs. The rest is on intangibles representing money that's already flowed out of the business. Of the cash spent on products and investments, a measure the company uses to assess investment in future technologies and growth, a big chunk relates to expenditures on intangibles such as technology and intellectual property. The pertinent question is why management waited so long to write down those investments. Its annual report last year noted that there was a risk of an impairment due to uh, optimistic expectations of future sales volumes and or gross margins. 
It also said there was a chance that changing technology plans, e.g. electrification and industry trends, e.g. reducing diesel sales, are not properly considered in the impairment calculations. So that I read that as they were being very kind of very rosy in their projections and hoping that these things didn't didn't affect them as much as they seemingly have. Further in this article, uh, the charge also uh, should be a warning for JLR's increasing increasingly precarious cash and liquidity position. The company continues to spend billions of pounds on investment and hundreds of millions more in dividends to its parents, to its parent, Tata, despite deepening operational woes that we've written about here and here. I had links in the other story here from the Washington Post. Worryingly, operating cash flow is falling relative to capital expenditure, making it harder to pay for investment without investments without dipping into debt. If the company's attempt to deliver on its cost-cutting program fail, continue failing to deliver, and sales don't improve, further spending on tangible assets will be the only credible way to improve cash flows. But JLR is already backed too far into that particular corner. In China, JLR continues to perform far worse than its luxury peers. Its underwhelming turnaround plan has only realized about a fifth of its 2.5 billion pound saving targets. Investors should hope management stops the cash from bleeding as fast as it has been spending. So I, I don't know. It's just uh, things aren't uh, aren't going too well. I I read that last part about the their turnaround plan. Didn't they just start the turnaround plan like a month or two ago? I mean, is it going to take a little bit longer than a month to to realize some? Well, well, yeah. And the other thing is, it seems like they keep announcing one turnaround plan after another. Or either that, or they keep changing the name of the same plan. I don't. I can't keep track. Yeah, I, I agree with that too. It seemed. I think it was all the same plan, Harold. And it seemed. My take on that. It seems like it was the same plan, and then as every month over a couple a couple months, things got worse. They like added to the plan, and then now or I just think, kept, you know, you know get, kept rebranding it to keep it fresh or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. We'll have an article coming up a little more digging a little deeper on the China uh, details. I think that's very interesting. But but so you heard some negative. We'll talk a little bit of positive, and that's JLR reports January 2019 U.S. sales. Sales were very good in the U.S. for January. Uh, Land Rover had its best ever January sales month with 7,385 units sold, a 15% increase from January of 2018. Jaguar sold 3,078 units, an 18% increase from the 2,600 units in January 2018. Overall, uh, JLR January sales reached 10,463 units, a 16% increase from January of 2018. So, Good for the U. I mean, yeah, JLR did very well in the U.S. Did very, very well. Yeah, and it's a it's a best ever January following a best ever year for 2018. It's just too bad we don't represent enough of their their global production. Right. So let's talk about that detail on on China and why what's happening there. This was from the Automotive News Europe. JLR hurt by quality control issues in China. I'll read a good bit of this i've highlighted a number of things i think it's it's interesting and and so i think also probably maybe new information at least coming out of china so jlr blames its latest quarterly loss largely on quote challenging market conditions in china unquote these include a rare decline in industry wide sales and the trade dispute between china and the u.s but those challenges are only part of the problem facing the company. What has rattled JLR's business in China most are persistent woes with reliability and dependability. New vehicle sales in China last year fell for the first time in the past 28 years. But the luxury market continued to grow, with sales rising 8%. Germany's big three... Audi, Mercedes, BMW, as well as Cadillac, Lexus, and Volvo all posted impressive sales growth in China last year. Continuing, JLR has never shipped vehicles from the U.S. to China. It's a stretch to say that trade tensions between the two countries have exerted any significant impact on local sales. What's really behind a 22% slide in JLR's China deliveries last year? It is lax control on product quality. Weak product quality has long been a problem with JLR, dating back to the, even the time when it was in the hands of Ford. JLR's China sales surged to 146,000 units in 2017 from 92,000 units in 2015. So again, it went almost 50,000, uh, over 50,000 units in two years. They increased their sales in China. Back to the article. Yet, because product quality was never effectively addressed, the number of defects reported by owners increased in tandem. 
In China, as well as the, as the U.S., both brands routinely rank well below the industry average for new and three-year-old vehicle quality and dependability based on owner surveys by J.D. Power & Associates. Local dealers burdened with a 60-day or larger supply of unsold new vehicles have offered deep, steep, excuse me, steep discounts to ease uh, inventory pressure. The problems have dented the brand image of, of Jaguar and Land Rover in China, rendering their products even less attractive to local consumers. And again, that's the article saying that. Uh, JLR has other challenges. It must integrate sales and distribution of locally built products and imported models. It also needs to roll out more electrified vehicles to meet local regulatory requirements. So there's your a little more detailed insight into JLR in China that we've heard. It's just challenging there. And I think this gives a lot more detail to that. Yeah, I think it's, you know, they probably uh, and rightfully should hold luxury vehicles to a much higher standard. But, you know, it's really kind of a scary thing when your quality doesn't measure up in China. Well, and but, but I, you know, the other thing is, I, I have, I will tell you that I take exception to the author's comment that the quality problems date back to the uh, all the way back to its ownership with Ford, because on Ford's watch, Jaguar started winning JD Power surveys. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Yeah, I was going to say that was when we, you know, Jaguar start and Land Rover started getting more reliable <laughs> right well they had <laughs> nowhere to go to up, go time. but up back then but the point is they did actually top those surveys for a few years so i wouldn't say that the quality was always bad on ford's watch Correct. yeah but you know i get it is it is important to have good reliability and quality these days and also if they're having quality and reliability issues causing them to lower prices that doesn't help it appear to be a luxury brand. No, but you is. might you might be able to get into the uh, really good value medium price brand segment. That's true, but it seems like that's maybe not actually working. But and doing it by default <laughs> because your product has problems is not the right way to go about that either. And that's true. And the my, quality really needs to be a focus for everyone all the time. And my read on the Chinese market is that there is usually, it sounds like there's luxury brands and then everything else. I don't know that there's that middle middle ground as you were referring to. It seems like there's you know luxury. Yeah, probably not. Brand, yeah. yeah. And I I have to say one thing that I'm not sure what the reality of this situation is because I don't have a finger on the pulse in China at all. What? Um, Why not? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I have friends over there, but I never talked to them about this. Um, they were saying that because uh, JLR doesn't import its vehicles from the U.S., some of the trade disputes that are currently happening are not affecting JLR in that way. However, it has been the, the situation in the past that when items are hard to get in China, especially luxury items, it actually increases the sales of those items. So it's possible that some of the the Cadillac and some of those other uh, marks that were mentioned might actually be selling better than JLR because they're so easy, they're so much harder to get right now. It's more of a status th thing. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. Now I don't know if that's the case at this time, but that has been a frequent frequent occurrence in the past. R remind people as I look at this article, it's just the sales differential between their competitors, you know, the Americans and the Germans. Land Rover, lost, for the first time ever, they lost sales there in 28 years, and everyone else went up. So there's clearly, they've, they have some problem they need to address. It's not, you know, they, they, there had been some indication in the, in the last couple months that maybe it wasn't just JLR, that it was like, oh, it's just China. It's the market conditions. Well, I think it's they have a specific market condition they need to address. Not Yeah, not, I don't think not, you can use that excuse anymore. You've got to look further. Related to that, uh, regarding their their uh, position in the market, you know, we, and we've already said that you know, JLR had a really good month in the U.S. Meanwhile, they haven't had in, in China because they've, as, you know, as we've just said, because of their – it was uh, in implied or assumed quality control issues. They have those quality control issues here in the U.S., but yet sales have went up. Consumer Reports came out with their top brands for 2019, and uh, JLR is among the lowest ranked brands. Uh, we'll look at the at the list here. Uh, Subaru is number one, then Genesis, Porsche, Audi, and Lexus. The bottom five, 
or the five lowest scoring brands uh, at 50, which I think is just a ranking uh, or a number, not a, not a ranking, but a number. Subaru was at the top at 81, and then Lexus at the top of the, the bottom of the five was 76. The top of the bottom <laughs> at 50 is Jeep. 49, Mitsubishi, 48 is Land Rover, 44 is Jaguar, and at the very bottom, also at 44, is Fiat. So it's I, interesting. I wonder if those numbers represent an approval rating. Uh, that might be it. I, I was trying to look for that here in the article. I didn't uh, give it what a specific ranking meant, and I'd, at least or I didn't see it. But it's interesting how you look at the difference between China and the U.S., even though Land Rover has that perception of not having the best quality or dependability, it's still selling very well, though. Uh, moving on, in uh, also further bad news along the business, uh, this is uh, Brexit will force JLR to idle its UK factories in April. Normally they have a, I'll, just, I'll read the article, uh, JLR alongside the rest of the British auto industry has been in borderline panic mode with Brexit looming, and now it's looking like the iconic British marks will idle four factories for an additional week or more in April according to a recent report by Motor One. JLR currently operates vehicle production facilities in Sully Hall, Castle Bromwich, and Hellwell, and an engine assembly plant in Wolverhampton, which it typically shuts down for a week in April. This year, that stoppage will be extended by at least a week. Only its UK factories will be affected by the shutdown, but it is still a significant bump in the road for the car maker. And they're blaming that specifically on Brexit and not the declining sales in China? I don't know if Land Rover is. Uh, this was just what the article from uh, Roadshow was indicating okay. that it was probably Brexit-related. I didn't go look at the uh, Motor One article. Well, one one thing to consider there is that the factories in the UK don't produce the vehicles that are sold in China. Is that correct? Because don't they have factories in China? They have factories in China, but they're— Much of the vehicles? They have factories in China, but I do believe they bring in— uh, parts for other markets, including China, that are made in the UK. I believe engines are aren't all are uh, are are not engines all made in the UK. Well, I think the Chinese is only an assembly plant; they don't make the parts there. Gotcha. Uh, that that may, maybe that's a better way to look at it. Yeah. So if you're assembling fewer, you need fewer parts. You know, obviously we know they're having financial difficulties, and uh, this these are just further downstream issues. Uh, even if you know, if you're idling a plant. Uh, it, it may or may not be directly related to Brexit, but Rex, Brexit is certainly a factor to consider. I mean, it's it's definitely going to affect things. All right, and it's easy to blame too. Yeah, yeah. Well, and just and just like they were saying about China, how how you know, well, China's just having a you know a little bit of a problem. It's not it's not us. Well, now it's <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now now it is. Well, further downstream financial difficulties. Land Rover Discovery SVX has been canceled. This was a hardcore off-roader uh, that was going to come out of the SVO department, I suppose we'll call it that. So the Discovery range, this was a more extreme off-road focused model with VA Power. The model, which was also due to launch the SVX sub-brand from JLR's special vehicles operations for its most extreme vehicles. SVX models would sit alongside SVR performance models and SV autobiography luxury cars as part of a three-prong range of vehicles fed fettled it's a new word i never heard of before fettled by svo uh, land rover has confirmed to autocar that a v8 engine that uh, is no longer destined for the discovery meaning the discovery svx is no longer going ahead in its current form however a spokesman said that the firm would still be pushing ahead with the svx badge in the future on unspecified models yeah it makes sense that they can't pull off a v8 at this point I was surprised that that was basically going to be one of the few V8s in their lineup right. <laughs> and yeah. that it was well, a new model. It would be limited production, but I think, you know, it's sort of diminishing returns, too, because there aren't many of them. And yet it kind of dilutes the other ones and confuses the public because there's so many different combinations and options you can get. Now, hopefully when they re if they redo the Discovery SVX, they provide a front facing winch as well as the rear facing winch <laughs> no, i never quite yeah. understood having only the rear facing winch option even though i know that i think uh lucky eight made a front facing yeah. winch mount right. for the discovery five but still you know i, I, I view every, every every hole in the lineup out of solo hall is just an opportunity for the for the aftermarket to get it right it's so true and yet they kind of don't want 
aftermarket parts anymore, which is ridiculous. Well, it doesn't stop <laughs> the aftermarket from figuring out a way, as they it's always true, do. It's true, for sure. And further downstream effects, JLR cancels the Range Rover SV Coupe. So in an unusual move, although I don't think it's as unusual as we think it is now, uh, JLR has canceled a vehicle on the cusp of production, the $295,000 Range Rover SV Coupe. JLR planned a short run of 999 of the Savelt hand-built three-door Rovers. The vehicle debuted 11 months ago at the Geneva Auto Show. Deliveries were due to start late last year. JLR confirmed the SV Coupe's demise this month, even though many customers had already configured their vehicles and placed their orders. Amid a cost-cutting program, it refers to internally as charge and accelerate. The company is aiming to slash nearly $3.2 billion in costs. We know that. And interestingly, uh, along with this being a hand-built vehicle, only the hood and the tailgate are shared with standard-issue Range Rovers while the remaining body panels were unique to the vehicle well that's yeah. one reason it's a three hundred thousand dollar vehicle yeah. right yeah built by hand with minimal <laughs> dipping into the parts bins yeah exactly that, that's expensive so when they th this is a uh, auto news europe and they say only the hood and tailgate the hood in british is the is the roof right right but in this case they might be speaking in american english it might be the bonnet. Might be. Might be hard I, to say. Yeah, it wasn't. I wasn't sure. I'd either. have to read the rest of it for for grammar inflections and things to figure that one out. But now it's, suffice to say, there's only a couple of panels that are that are stock panels, and the rest right. are all custom. Next article was this saying the same thing, but I I liked the phrasing, so I'm just I, I I felt like I needed to read it. This is from Road and Track, and this is Chris Perkins. The headline: The stunning Range Rover SV Coupe was too good for this world. <laughs> His opening line I like. The SUV coupe trend of applying a rakish fastback roof to an otherwise practical SUV is unequivocally bad. The two-door Range Rover SV Coupe, however, is good. Evidently, too good for this world, though, because it's being canceled before a single example has been built. So this was the three-door uh, Range Rover Coupe. Again, they were just going to build a small number, but not anymore. They're going to build an even smaller number now. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Zero is a very small number. <laughs> On some positive news, JLR reveals exciting new engine plans. So JLR has revealed it is to produce its own three-liter, six-cylinder engine in the Midlands. And there, this is part of the Ingenium line of engines that they have, and it's going to be fitted exclusively into a new special edition of the Range Rover Sport, the HST, although they may eventually push the engine out to other cars. I suspect they probably would over time. That is the uh, inline six twin charged hybrid and this other article from Jalopnik. And it's not only an old inline six we're getting either. It's a turbocharged an electrically supercharged three liter motor that's mated to a 48 volt mild hybrid system that puts this engine along the most high tech ones probably going into any car you can get right now. The engine debuts on the new Range Rover Sport HST, which is available for order in the UK now, but it should make it to other models and markets soon. It is a member of the Ingenium family of modular engines, which to this point have been four-cylinder gasoline or diesel motors, but could be expanded to become six-cylinder units. Indeed, we have heard a while back that uh, the new I6s could replace the V6 engines used across the JLR family. Here's what we know about from the automaker, and this is from Jalopnik. It is rated at 395 horsepower and 406 pound-feet of torque and can propel the Range Rover Sport from 0 to 60 in a respectable 5.9 seconds. The electric supercharger can spool up to its maximum 65,000 RPM, that's the blower and not the motor before you call me out for typos, in just half a second. Tech that virtually eliminates turbo lag. Additionally, the 48-volt hybrid system recaptures energy during deceleration, which it can then redeploy through torque assistance, JLR said. Now, I really like what they're doing there because, well, I've, I've looked at various hybrid solutions and the supercharger solution electric supercharger is not used often enough superchargers are very nice because they give you fairly immediate extra power but they usually cause an extra load on the engine whereas when you have an electric hybrid system like that supercharging or electrifying the supercharger means you don't have the extra load on the engine but you have the immediate power Right, you don't have the, the parasitical mechanical loss to the engine, but yeah. it does take a fair amount of amp hours of electricity to drive it, hence you use that hybrid system to drive the battery that runs the supercharger. 
Exactly. And then you have the advantage of being able to put that parasitic load on in the form of regeneration for right. that electric battery pack when you actually want to slow down the engine. <laughs> right. and, and that actually helps your brakes, too. It takes some of the load off your brakes because now the engine is doing more of the braking. Exactly. What's and the difference? There is actually, there's a company in the U.S. who has come up with a similar electric supercharger there i think they call it the e-charger um, I've seen, uh, yeah been, i've seen that yeah it's a pretty nice setup so this this is nice to see that going into land rovers from the factory because i think that's a setup that works well with land rover what's well, the nice, nice thing to, about doing it at the factory is you can have it much more integrated with the engine management and that's usually a, a better thing absolutely and you what's know, the difference being able, between you're a supercharger basically getting electric performance by being able to do zero to sixty in what five and a half seconds? Right. Five point nine. Five point nine, yeah. What's the difference between a turbocharger and a supercharger again? A turbocharger is a subset of turbo of superchargers. A supercharger is any device that pressurizes the intake air. And it's they do that so that the cylinder can get more full of air, so you get more combustion per cycle. A turbocharger is a special kind of supercharger because it's driven by the hot exhaust gases leaving the engine, which gives you that extra boost essentially for free because there's no rotating uh, load on the engine. But the problem is it takes a while for it to build that boost because the engine has to has push to... some more gas through it, get that right. turbine up to speed, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why there's that big lag. It feels like you're stretching a rubber band before you get any boost. Right. Whereas the mechanical superchargers, either belt driven or in this case, a big electric motor that spins it, that's, that's instant. And then there's a related problem with turbochargers is that because you're using the heated exhaust to power the turbocharger, you're having even hotter air pushed into the engine, which, as it gets compressed, heats up even more. Hence and the reason for the intercooler. <laughs> exactly. And, um, and even a super mechanical supercharger uh, really kind of needs to have an intercooler on it because any gas you squeeze, it gets hot. That's uh, Charles' law. It's the principle behind how diesels work. So you compress that air, even with an, even with a supercharger, you're going to want to cool it down before it goes into the engine. Absolutely. And if you wish to see some uh, a bunch of photos of the Range Rover Sport HST, the first production uh, Land Rover vehicle to launch with a mild hybrid powertrain, there will be a link to Car Scoops. They have a bunch of photos so if you want to see that. Next, a Jaguar story, just because you know. It's, because we can. Because we can, and it's a, and it's a, we should, you know, it's a sister company. I'd hate to see it go away. If you're uh, interested in an iPace in the U.S., they are offering zero percent financing on the iPace to boost sales. So the sales of the J, uh, Jaguar iPace uh, haven't been strong in the U.S., but the automaker is now offering zero percent financing for a special limited offer to boost sales of the all electric vehicle. I think it runs out the end of March. Uh, there are some European markets where the electric crossover is doing well, but it is uh, slow overall. Last year, Jaguar delivered about 6,500 I-Pace I paces, I pace I, I pace SUVs in Europe during the first nine months. Uh, in the U.S., the vehicle only had a few months of sales in 2018, and uh, Jaguar delivered 400 units, so 6,500 in Europe, 400 in the U.S. 2019 uh, started very slow for the I-Pace with just over 1,000 sales globally. So there you go. Yeah, so, it would be interesting to see more of those on the road. I finally got to see one in person at uh, the British Invasion Car Show because for the first time ever, uh, because well, partially because it was uh, Jaguar Land Rover Mark year, uh, but also they decided to actually have a real presence there. And so they had a showing of vehicles, including the I-Pace. Um, it definitely looks better in person. I think it looks pretty good. Oh, okay. It looks pretty good, I think, in the photos. How does it... Do, have you seen a yeah. uh, Tesla Model X? Do you know any idea how it compares to that? It's much smaller than the Model X. Okay. okay. Um, that said, it does have height-adjustable suspension, as we would expect from Land Rover. So it had a decent amount of clearance. So it could be a little more useful in varied terrain. It's still not really an off-road SUV, even right. though it's relatively capable. 
but it's you know an interesting option for an all electric SUV here in the U.S. It's I think it's the only it is the only what all electric SUV next to the Tesla. I think that's it. I don't. Think I think that's a, true. I don't think there's yeah. another one. Yeah. But what's how, I how does it compare with? How does it compare with the Tesla in terms of combustibility? <laughs> it's probably on par. Okay. <laughs> similar battery technology so the moving on to models that are in production 2020 land rover range rover evoke stylish perhaps too much so this is from cars.com and the new range rover evoke has officially debuted and this i uh, will read some positives and a little bit of negative i found it quite and this is uh, at cars.com and the author here is uh, brian normile uh, I found it quite impressive in my time with it on the show floor. The interior is luxurious and the optional in-touch, in-control, touch, pro, duo, entertainment system certainly, quote, looks the part of a futuristic vehicular nerve center. Rear seat room was enough that I could theoretically sit behind myself and have and be comfortable in both positions. I am six foot one, though the rear seating position did leave my knees higher than I'd like. Rear headroom is also more than adequate. And while the higher belt line and smaller window seem to shrink the cabin, the panoramic panoramic roof opens it back up with lots of light and keeping you from feeling claustrophobic outside the evokes updated looks are fairly iterative it is still the same floating roof angled belt line and attractive if stunted profile with the wheels located almost at all four corners and little front or rear overhang its face gets the most significant update where it seems Land Rover has taken the face off the Range Rover Velar and grafted it onto the Evoque. That's exactly what they did. Uh, it looks good and probably pretends the future of Range Rover models. The available tech is also remarkable. It is the first Land Rover to get clear sight ground view technology, which displays what is in front of and under the Evoque, making negotiating obstacles and dangers easier when you don't have someone to spot for you. I'd like to know when, uh, this is my comment, How when has anyone ever spotted someone driving an Evoque? I don't think it's ever happened. But clear well, I, I've spotted plenty. I've just never been a spotter for one. <laughs> and isn't that isn't that clear sight ground view? Isn't that the clear bonnet? That's what the clear bonnet was, right? I, I think yeah, it's the production version of that or whatever. And, and yeah, I think it doesn't attempt to actually project onto the bonnet area so that you can't see the bonnet, but it gives you the same. Oh, this is technology. It probably uses cameras and puts them onto the center display, probably, is what it does. It doesn't, as you said, it doesn't project on the windscreen through the bonnet. It's projecting on the screens that are available in the vehicle. That's probably the difference. Right. Yeah. And his negative, of course, uh, is the in touch, in control. I want to say in touch. It's in control, touch pro duo. Uh, uh, appearance. Uh, that's because I'm not a big fan of removing most physical controls and replacing them with touchscreen based systems. So, yeah, I mean, geez, you know, if you want to control your world with a touchscreen, just stay in the basement with an iPad. Yeah. Or just plug your iPad into the vehicle. I mean, that seems to be, or just wouldn't that be stay easier? home. Just, you know, don't <laughs> go driving. You think the world can be controlled with a touchpad? Just don't go anywhere. Well, James Bond did it in that with that BMW. That was cool. Yeah, well, that was Bond. That's You're true. not Bond. <laughs> That's true. That's certainly true. The new Evoke will start at $43,645, including destination charges. That's a price increase of only $850 over the 2019 model. However, the big news for the new Evoke is the 48-volt mild hybrid system introduced on this model. To get this system, you'll have to step up to the R Dynamic trim. The cheapest one of those will run you $47,595 American. So $4,000 so more. Yeah, exactly. So that that sounds about right for a mild hybrid system. Presumably yeah. that's the same supercharger setup, just not on the three liter inline six. Comparison, the Jaguar I-Pace starts in America at $69,500. Yeah, that just seems like a little too much for what amounts to a fancy golf cart. <laughs> it's uh i think it's the performance is a little better <laughs> oh yeah and so is the safety and all those kinds of things uh it's i think that's comparable though to a model x i think model x's are in that that price range i think it's maybe even less expensive than the model x okay I yeah, don't and, recall. And, and tesla loses money on those so yeah yeah i mean the, the technology ain't cheap the 
a review of the or d- debut of the Range Rover Velar SV Autobiography Dynamic. This is from uh, Road Show again. Uh, Land Rover on Tuesday unveiled the Range Rover Velar SV Autobiography Dynamic Edition. So th- the, I like this line. This brevity adverse trim name <laughs> carries some of its fanciest appointments Range Rover has on offer. Unlike other SV Autobiography models, however, Land Rover says this one will exist for just one year. So they've canceled the three door hand built SV coop and but they're going to make a special one year sv autobiography dynamic four door velar but what is, uh, well, well but see the see the sv coop was even more exclusive than that because they made it for less than one year significantly less than one year <laughs> and it's not a velar either to be clear that was that well, right was yes absolutely but... so this will this one is not your uh, upon first glance it's obvious this isn't your average velar there are large intakes in the new front bumper cooling both its engine and its beefier brakes there's a new grill new side moldings quad tailpipe sticking through the rear bumper there's also a new tray under the transmission tunnel to better channel air the pink color you see here is only available on the velar on this velar variant and a contrasting black roof is standard and it's kind of a blue gray it's kind of a nice nice color uh, it kind of looks pretty good I, I suspect it would look really good in in good sunny daylight the interior ramps things up even further uh, replete with double stitched perforated quilted windsor leather it's available in four different color schemes the front seats have 20-way adjustability heating ventilation and massage the shift panel p- paddles are made of real aluminum there's also a sportier steering wheel knurled controls for the infotainment system carbon fibers available for the trim the 12.3 inch gauge screen has a unique startup screen because why wouldn't it and the velar sv autobiography dynamic edition sports a five liter supercharged gas v8 putting out 550 horsepower at 502 pound feet of torque enough to push the car zero to 60 in just 4.3 seconds its eight speed uh, automatic transmission has been configured to handle the extra power and the all wheel drive system has a new transfer box dedicated to handling all that hustle there's also an active exhaust system (laughs) i want to hear this that can go from somewhat silent to violent deep to violent depending on driving conditions (laughs) though there are ways to do that anyway (laughs) and i'm sure they and and cars already do that you know do they give you a knob on the dash that allows you to go from (laughs) zero all the way up to 11 all right let's move into defender watch so the new defender is coming out Uh, a couple stories we'll touch on on those here in a few minutes uh that we have left in this segment so a lighthearted Twitter exchange unearthed a curious Land Rover interior shot purportedly showing the dashboard of the upcoming 2020 Land Rover Defender, mm-hmm. easily identifiable since the steering wheel and the passenger side proudly claim the vaulted Defender name, but the other seemingly confirming the image's legitimacy is even more interesting. A Land Rover press executive's response suggesting that the poster delete the image as it was, quote, not supposed to be shared. And I guess Land Rover did confirm that. I saw another article, which I... Oh, here we go. Jalopnik quotes another Land Rover PR person as saying the image is, quote, an older, out-of-date internal photo, unquote. Not much more. Kind of as expected to to me. Yeah, sorry. Uh, It didn't seem to match some of the spy photos that I had seen either. It could be a little older, but it has the, even if it is a little older, I think the, I think the generalities there are, are there. You've got, it looks like the interior of other Land Rovers with the, you know, the, the binnacle that, that covers your, uh, the gauges, uh, the shifter looks familiar. The only, yeah. the only real difference is the center of the steering wheel says Defender. Yeah, that was it, really. Yeah. And, and it's, I mean, I mean, in the one thing that's kind of a styling cue, if you will, at least a nod to the original Defenders, it's a four-spoke steering wheel. R- yes, true. that's right. With, the, with that square box in the middle. middle. I mean, that part's yeah. kind of cool, I got to say. I did like, yeah, the, I like that. I did like the box in the middle, too. I thought that was a nice, it, hopefully that, that does continue. But it's, you know, it's far too fancy and chromey to be, be real. But, but uh, you know, that's the one thing I got from that. The other thing I took from this was the shifter being on the console uh, tells me that there most likely won't be a manual transmission. I suspect that's all electronically controlled now, and I'm sure you could make a 
you know, a manual shifter through the, you know, through the firewall using probably electronic components, but I'm, I'm suspecting there probably isn't going to be an option. That's just, I, I don't think they're selling enough of them anymore to, 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 to make it worth their while. There was a series of, of these defender, new defender articles and you found one Morgan. I'll let you talk about it. It's called the new defender, a hoax. <laughs> so what was this about? <laughs> yes, this was a, a recent YouTube video from Andrew uh, St. Pierre White, who does a lot of, he's a uh, 4X Overland on YouTube. He's been around for quite a while and he started out the video with sort of the usual discussion of what Land Rover has to do right to make a good Defender replacement, which we have discussed ad nauseum and we seem to be on the same page as he is there. But he wraps up the video saying that he, he has a sort of a conspiracy theory or a theory in his case <laughs> uh, that all of the camo spy shots we've been shown so far are not actually the new defender but are just purely an lr4 dressed up in camo and we've, a teaser uh, and we've said exactly. that but we've we've thought that too so what well, he's saying well, it's not the, it, you're saying it's not the he's saying it's not the actual new defender body sitting on a new defender frame he's thinking it's all lr4 or all discovery 4 or something yeah, that seems to be what he's saying, and he sort of takes some of the body elements and shows where they've been covered up, and it essentially looks identical. Now, am I correct in re remembering that it is the new Defender is going to be built on the LR4 platform? Uh, I think it's the. It might in fact be the Disco Five platform, but we've uh, discussed in the past that we think that it that they have been testing the new. Defender on platforms for years, so that could that could be where that feeds into his thinking that maybe it's right. in, it's on this Disco Four. Um, well, well the LR Four Disco Four is body on frame. The Disco Five is unibody, so they are different platform wise. Right, and yeah, the, so it's... the new Defender is supposed to be built in Slovakia alongside the Five, and I think that's where the thinking is that it will be based on the Disco Five. However, on the other hand, if you could make the the, the Disco Four body fit onto the LR uh, Disco Five platform, uh, you could save a ton of money in body development costs if you just use the old tooling you're not using anymore. Yep, right. And it certainly would be shaped a lot more like a Defender, <laughs> or, or more, more like more Discovery like a, more like a Land Rover should be shaped. We'll leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah, as we talked, I think last month, there's an affinity for the boxy Defender, and, and people still think the LR4 Discovery Four is still boxy. Certainly, compared well, to the I think, I think, I think I think Disco should be Disco should be boxy as well as Defenders, to be honest. Yeah, yeah your your, ra your range, range Rovers can be swoopy and and curvy, but your everything with a Land Rover name should be a box. I tend to agree with that as well. I, so I, 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 don't, I don't guess I don't see this as a conspiracy thing. I'm... No, it's it's more that he he just thinks it's a hoax. Now I will say that. Well, wait, 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 wait. What's what's a hoax? Photos, well, what's a hoax? That it's well, he thinks that it's highly likely that it's not actually the Defender. That it's just an LR4. <laughs> Well, just, okay. another, just another <laughs> development mule used well, to tease us. Right. Okay. So, you, you, and just to be, just to get specific on what he's talking about as is a hoax, is he's saying that the the images that they revealed, that Land Rover revealed at the end of last year, he's saying that's a hoax. Right. That's my photos. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. No. I'm sorry. I don't. <laughs> I, I, that I can't and buy. That's where I that I don't. Over to no. conspiracy theory. <laughs> that now that I agree right. with you on. I agree with you on. If if Land Rover hadn't come out with those photos at the end of the year or that video and showed us something and showed it moving and showed it traveling in the snow and other places then if he had come out with that and said well this is all you know some sort of quote unquote hoax and it's a, it's just development and it's not going to look like this in any way shape or form i buy that but now that land rovers come out with something and put a stake in the ground i can't well, right well, how is andrews on on the apollo 11 landing <laughs> That's a good question. I am not sure. And what about 9 11? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I will say that while he points out a number of aspects that do look identical if covered up the way that they cover them up, there are some aspects 
like the rear door, which is clearly shown numerous times to be the swing away side opening door, the barn door, if you will, as opposed to the LR4 okay. discovery style door. Yeah, you know, my point is if they if they stole a whole lot of design cues and maybe even a few panels off the LR4, that might not be a bad thing, all, yeah. all things considered. Right, right. I agree. I'm I'm interested in what it finally looks like, as is everybody. Of course, this is all based on our conversation here is based on what you saw in that video. So there, you know, he may have said, you know, he's all making this up and you didn't hear that or, you know, because it was what, a 13 minute video. I'm right. I'm not not saying (laughs) I could be misconstruing some information. Yes, exactly. Yeah, (laughs) And his his opinions may not necessarily reflect the opinions of Sinister Media and its personnel. (laughs) Agreed. (laughs) Staff and uh, staff and producers. Yeah. There was another rant. Can I call it a rant, I suppose, or editor? editorial comment friend of the show graham bell from a to a expeditions his article was uh, editorial i think uh who killed the defender i see his points number one was that uh you know his concern was along with uh, like the past gentleman of it's got to be it's got to hit the mark and it's got to be correct if people are going to buy it and if it's going to be there but i what i think graham gets into is existing traditional heritage type customers if people and, and and my general take is if people were going to buy a defender they would have already bought it that's that's i think the the people he's talking about which is kind of like us if you like that you would have bought one already and land rovers you know, needs to move into the future well, mind Old you he school. spends a lot of time in parts of the world that can't handle modern vehicles at all uh, and and in his use case requires a lot of field serviceability, which no new vehicle is going to be capable of doing. So he's going to skew towards the traditional, mm-hmm. what we know a Defender to be. And right. And those and those Defenders though have been available in those countries, n- not here in the U.S. To be to be clear, and they've already been available. If they were going to sell and people wanted to buy them, they would have bought them. Right. And that's well, and, and yeah. he actually makes that point by saying that you know terrorists don't use them, uh, <laughs> the NGOs and the UN and Oxfam don't use them. Uh, they're using Toyotas and other things. I'm like, yeah, exactly. Well, he, well, he cites a lot of lot of mismanagement in the sales team for for a lot of those losses because those sectors were once dominated by Land Rover. Right. 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 And he also uh, cites reliability issues, which we've already been over <laughs> today. Right. That, Right. Comparatively, they're exactly. not as reliable as Toyota's and why? marketing hype. Now, now, my, my <laughs> and why is it because I, I to- don't have a problem with Land Rover no longer being the vehicle of choice uh, amongst terrorists, but still. Right. Well, and, and, and that's part the- of it was actually the sus- susceptibility or lack of hardening for things like roadside bombs in in military use in, right, right in, yeah right yeah, right. yeah the right. same reason the humvee is, is obsolete as well it right. just it's not mine resistant right but that that goes to the to, to he proves the, the kind of the point i'm making is the reason that the people didn't buy the land rovers or the reasons you just mentioned but the main one was because it didn't modernize and keep up what vehicles overtook them the ones that modernized and kept up with the current current needs and demands like the toyota land cruiser like the hilux or whatever we call it here in the us right. and, you know that's well, that's, a, that's my that... my point is he was it's it's this crying about and and I hope that you well, know, yeah, that negative. I think somebody but, pointed out you know. that had the Land Rover evolved at that same rate, it would probably already look like the things we're we're not liking. Yep. Thank you. You said it the best way. That's exactly right. Well, I will I will jump in and say that the Land Cruisers that they're discussing are on are more similar to the Defender than they are to the Land Cruisers that we see driving around in the U.S. That they are the uh, right. farm and and industry vehicles, not the plush vehicles that we get here that have tons maybe, of safety features. Maybe Hilux would have been a better would have been a better right. Uh, a more... Yeah, they're much more similar to the Hilux. Do we have the we did we ever have the Hilux here? And if so, what well, was it? We, we had the Toyota pickup. Right, and it was it was called the Toyota pickup. That's not the Tacoma, yeah, basically. Okay. No, well, the no. Tacoma, okay. it's... B- before before it became known as the Tac- the Tacoma happened after the the Tundra, the originally the T100, uh, their big truck. Right. Once they started offering a big truck and had to differentiate between the big one and the little one, then they gave it a name. But before uh, that, it was just the Toyota truck. Okay. Right. 
and, and it's and the Tacoma was for a while there similar but not quite the same. And I believe that was only made in the U- for and in the U.S. Right, the big one. The Tacoma. Well, that would be the no, tundra. no, the, no, the big one, the Tundra, the T one hundred originally it was called right, and, and yeah, I think that was for developed for the U S market, and and when you give it a name like the T one hundred, because you're going up against the F one fifty, right, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yes, right, right, which is the same thing with the with the Honda Ridgeline that was only available or is only available in the U S and made exclusively here anyway, but that's off. Well, that that one's a totally different beast. The, but I think it was just a car as with a pickup bed. But that was the same. It was the same principle, though. Uh, they were making. Well, a, that, that's basically a Honda El Camino. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it is. Could you have called it the the when they took what they call the Defender when they rebadged Defenders as Hondas? No, oh, that was oh, a that disco. was a Discovery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was it? What was it? What they called it? The, they didn't call it the, the Discovery though. It was the, the Crossroad Honda cr- Crossroad? Cr- I think Crosswind it was. Crossroad. Crossroad, I think. It's interesting to read just for, because Graham always brings a, a different perspective to things than we normally get in this country. It's kind of, you know, because he has a global perspective. He spends a lot of time in third world countries. So his viewpoints are interesting, whether you agree with them or not. Yeah, I agree. I go back to my opening comment. He was talking about the people that listen to the show and people who are heritage fans of Land Rover. I think that's that's really who he was speaking for and about. And uh, I agree with that part of it. But you know, Land Rover also needs needs to move on and get new audiences. Where has Oxford gone now? And we've talked about this. Uh, it is in Singapore. Oxford, of course, the Oxford SNX891. I'm sure you already know about it. If you're just catching up with the show, I refer you back to First Overland. The gentleman who made First Overland, our very first guest on the show, Graham Aldis, has a newsletter. And I uh, have a link to it in the show notes. But I recommend you go out and, and uh, sign up for his newsletter to keep track of what's happening. And he has uh, explained that Oxford is in Singapore. Singapore and the part I wanted to read to you and I'll let you read the rest on your own but but who will film this epic journey because we must see it I hear you cry that's Graham well much as I'd like to be there with my camera I'm happy to say that I think Adam has found a safe pair of hands uh, when we were at Anglesey we met a young video professional named Alex Biscobi he is a Land Rover enthusiast who studied Burmese history at Cambridge and now lives in Myanmar uh, Burma his show reel at Grammar Productions is well worth watching and his portfolio of productions about Burma and the Far East is in impressive he will be making some sort of ambitious video record but again just what it will be is still to be decided and financed so whatever is decided i'll try to to make this the very place where announcements are made so we can all share and we wish whoever it is who makes the journey every success so So, so let me get this straight the the travels of the oxford truck are going to be filmed by a cambridge man (laughs) yes yes you're right (laughs) You are right, sir. And I have nice. I have already reached out to them to under, to you know get them on the show or talk about it and hear what's going on. So we have uh, tried to plug into that. And, well, and that uh, works because the Oxford truck was driven by Cambridge men. So go out and uh, check on the First Overland newsletter. Finally, a little bit of event news. Uh, I traveled it was now two weekends ago. Yeah, two weekends ago to the. A main winter romp, and I drove the 1987 Land Rover Defender 110, and had a. That was just last weekend, dude. Was it last weekend? Oh, oh this weekend. That's right, because yeah, it was last. Was it really? First, by the time our listeners get this, it will have been uh, two weeks. Well, but yeah, yes. anyway. Well, it was mid February. Trip was fine. Had a good time. It was nice. The uh, I guess really, the, it's uh, it's very much an informal event. So if you've not been before, uh, it's and if you're expecting to go to an event where we're we're going to meet at 9 o'clock, and at 9.02, there's going to be a trail review, and then at you know, 9.08, they're going to look at your truck, and then we're going to be on the trail by 9.15. It is not that kind of event. It's very much uh, informal. Uh, people do gather and then get together and say, hey, do you want to to go run these trails. Yes, let's go run the trails. I ran with uh, our friend Bob in his discovery, and we ran ran a, a couple trails. Was... Did you bring an interpreter with you? <laughs> I did actually interpret for others. <laughs> as much as I love Bob, man, he, he, I, I cannot understand about a third of what he's saying. It is. It's. Uh, there are times when I find myself asking, "Excuse me," and he's used to that. I think by now, people ask him to repeat himself, and. 
it's interesting to see other people do that to him also. So that I realize it's not just me. I'll see other people asking him, what did he say? And I, it, we were in the, in the truck one time and this guy, uh, he was going to came the opposite direction and, and Bob asked a question and the guy said something and Bob asked a question. And the guy's like, what? And Bob had asked it like four times before the guy finally, he, you know, he, Bob was asking which, which direction, did you go on this hill? Yeah, um, I, I have lo- I have a few Scottish friends and I have no trouble understanding them. But Bob, <laughs> wow! I mean, that dude needs a subtitle machine. He does. <laughs> but the weather was great. It was sunny, relatively warm for the for the basically forty eight hours that we were there and ran the trails. There was a good bit of snow on the ground. The, I guess really the the big news though had to do with the future of the main winter romp, and it took place outside of the winter rump itself, which is uh, very quickly. I talked to Bruce while I was there. They, the land that they use, because he has uh, the the rump takes place a little bit on his land, but there's also down the road where the warming hut is, uh, that is the the, uh, Habitat for Humanity people run is on land that they have been using from friends or neighbors that own that land. And, in pretty much short order, those folks said they were willing to sell. And Bob put together a uh, kind of a GoFundMe, and they raised, they needed $40,000 to buy that land. I think it's 160 acres. And they raised it in f- like I, under 48 hours. They raised the, wow. uh, the, the money to yeah. get it. So. And as I understand it, the principal architect of that was Peter Vollers from the Vermont Overland. I, uh, yes, I believe putting together the the, the funding. Yes, right. and it's going to go t- into a trust, and so it, it's not Peter or Bruce buying the land. It's going to go into a trust for future Maine winter romps. So they will then be able to use that land and use it for the romp. That's really impressive. Oh well, yeah. I mean, if you, if the land's been bought, you pretty much guarantee it's going to be there. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, and I suspect it'll continue in its kind of informal means, and of course, no whining, because that is the number one principle of the I main. I think window that's romp. the only rule there: no whining. no whining. And if any of our listeners uh, did go to the romp and you received or you have extra winter romp stickers, I need some, please. Uh, I got some when I was there. I even got a shirt, and so I. I picked up my shirt. It's in a plastic bag. I got a couple stickers because I want to put them on the truck. And I put the stickers because I was going into the bar and I put the stickers into the shirt bag. I get home. I open up the shirt bag and turns out the shirt is in a bag, but it's a completely sealed bag. And it so it, it goes over itself, if that makes any sense. So the opening is passed through. So I lost my stickers. Oops. Yeah. And they're really cool stickers, too. So if anybody. Well, they were. Stuff, cool stickers they still are cool stickers i wanted i would like one or there's two kinds i'd like one of each if possible i'd be willing to we'll see trade a center steer sticker for them could very well do that so that was uh main winter romp just a good time it's nice to go out in the trails bounce around you know they were they, they always change we we uh one or two trails we end up doing like doing two or three times within a couple hours just because of the who you'd hook up with and the the way the the trails were there and they would change between that it was just you know because the the snow would be kind of dry but then as people would drive over it it would moisten up a little bit and maybe the weather would warm up a bit so it would would get wet and so it'd be a little more slippery so it, it kept changing i definitely hope to make it up there next year hopefully you should and as a side note we went to uh, dinner on uh, the there's uh, myself and Bob and Heidi uh, Dave Carroll's uh, wife. She went up to spread some of Dave's ashes at uh, at the at the romp, as that's what he wanted. It was one of his favorite events, and we went out to eat on Saturday. We ended up going to an Indian restaurant, and we all agreed it was probably some of the best Indian we'd ever had. I just throw that out. Bob, who has traveled extensively, big fan of Indian food, some of the best he's ever had. So, and you wouldn't think you'd find that in Maine. Uh, in Waterville, Maine, very, yeah, kind of a small co- little college town. It was, uh, it was very good. Nice. And I, I understand the Defender of Defenders was on site this year. Yes, I didn't know that until after, and I didn't see him. And I also believe, I don't know if this is it was too widely known, but uh, Jeff Aronson missed the Maine Winter Romp this year, and that's the first time he has not attended. So he has broken. Oh, wow. Yes. Huh conspicuous in his absence huh Um, i think he had a work thing come up that's the news for february 2019 
Commonwealth Classics is a direct importer of classic cars and trucks from Europe and South America. They're a registered Virginia dealership with a physical showroom just 45 minutes west of Washington, D.C. They specialize in importing and restoring different makes, models, and variants of vehicles not originally sold in the United States. Their vehicles are imported, titled, and available for you to test drive before you buy. For the Land Rover enthusiast looking for two-door Range Rover Classics, TDI-powered Discoveries, or beautifully restored Defenders, their showroom in Marshall, Virginia is a unique destination. Looking for something special? They can help source, restore, and import that special truck you've been looking for. Contact Commonwealth Classics for your next classic vehicle. Commonwealth Classics. Visit www.cwclassics.com. From the wilds of Alaska to the searing heat of the outback in Australia, what will you find in the back of a discerning overlanding vehicle? An LT Wright Knives Overland Machete, of course. These are handmade from 1075 high carbon steel and your choice of either black or natural micarta. Need something that will stand out in the woods? Opt for the orange G10. It won't blend in with your surroundings wherever you wander. LT Wright Knives is a small company with a family feel. Located in Wintersville, Ohio, they have a passion for what they do. Anything from from everyday carry to bushcrafting to the aforementioned overland specific piece ltwk has you covered each knife is thoughtfully designed built and tested before it heads out the door although they look good enough for the display cabinet these knives like to work put the knife through its paces and you know you're backed by a lifetime guarantee so carve slice and chop to your heart's content ltwk creates knives for bushcraft edc hunting cooking and overlanding so you have a lot of choices. Carry your preferred LT Wright knives, model with pride. You're helping to support an all-American company that will stand behind their product with a lifetime guarantee and the satisfaction of a job well done. These heirloom quality pieces will outlast your adventure, so plan well, drive safely, and carry an LTWK. Find out more online at ltwrightknives.com. And now on the Center Steer Podcast, joining us all the way from California, United States, is Deborah Najum. She is a three-time Rebel Rally competitor in a Discovery 4. Welcome, Deborah. Hi, how are you guys doing? Fantastic. Everything sounding all right on your end? Everything sounds good. Good, good. Yeah, it sounds much better. We did some, for the listeners, we were doing some testing ahead of time. And you're now doing this standing on uh, standing on your head uh, on a cell phone with one foot out the door in the window, right, yeah. to get a good signal? Yeah. With tin foil well, out of my that's head. That's what you have to do in Texas if you're if you're joining us on Skype, apparently. I'm, I'm glad you remembered that, Harold. Yeah, we did have... Laura, Laura Shacklett. Yep. Yeah, we had so much trouble getting her connected. Oh, geez. And yeah, she, Skype is interesting. Deborah, you have competed in the Rebel Rally, which is really cool. How did you get involved in the Rebel Rally? And and, and start off by telling li our listeners, even though we, we've talked about it before, but tell them what the Rebel Rally is. Okay, so uh, the Rebel Rally is a ten day. Well, it's ten days of a ten day event with seven days of competition, and it's an all female off road event uh, where we are seeking checkpoints every day, twenty to twenty five checkpoints that we're given the GPS coordinates for, and we find them using only a map and compass. We are completely unplugged with no internet, no GPS, no drive directions, no ways. <laughs> um, and we uh, go for those, you know, day in and day out, basically seven days um, competing, looking for these checkpoints. And at the end of seven days, it's ended with a big, huge gala in San Diego. We start, uh, we start up in Southern uh, in Northern California, I'm sorry, Northern California, Lake Tahoe area. And we cover about 1500 miles over the seven days. How did you get into the <laughs> rebel rally then? So it was interesting because we, um, we were new to like kind of off-roading my family. We started a off, you know, we started a company called off the grid rentals. And then I purchased my Land Rover and was looking for Land Rover events. Cause we'd gone through to a few Jeep events and I went to the Western national Land Rover rally I met a lot of really great individuals there. And after that, uh, one of the gals I met there, she tagged me on Facebook when the Rebel Rally came up. And she's like, you should do this. And I read, you know, I read about it. And actually, it's funny, I was drinking wine with my girlfriends. And I was like reading out loud. And I was like, seven days unplugged. I'm like, no one can call me. This sounds fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm, uh, I was like, I was in. I'm like, that. and my friends were like, what are you going to do with your kids? I'm like, I don't care. They'll be fine. <laughs> well, that's the wine talking there. <laughs> that was the wine talking, but it, you know, I made it happen and uh, it was, 
you know, it's, it's, a, it's difficult, you know, it's a long road to get in training wise and start doing that. But yeah, no, I definitely, all parts of it really appealed to me really from the beginning, you know, just the challenge, the challenge of like being, you know, just not using electronics when I come from, I come from a really strong, like computer background, I have a degree in computer information systems. So I just thought it would be really interesting not to use tech for seven days. So it just really grabbed me. If, right. if I may pause, if I may pause you, it's amazing the number of people that, especially in the U.S., that are into Land Rovers are also techie people because all every one of us here on the show it has some sort of tech connection in some way, and it's, it's nice to see that you're you're another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean yeah. tech is fantastic, but I mean I think we I think you can appreciate like things that aren't tech too and low tech, you know, like we're things right. that, you know, actually when you say it's not, we're not using tech, that's not true. We're using like all kinds of technology, just not device technology. You know, we're not using, you know, so. Using old technology, still, you're using previous, yeah. you're just, previous just not yeah. using, just not using electronic technology, exactly. using yeah. mechanical, so, chemical, et cetera. Right. Right. So I think that's what, gra you know, I mean, so we say it's not technology, but it is, but it's not, it's just not current or I don't know. It's not what the common, it's not the technology people are using like, day to day right now right. so but it is definitely and that's why i thought it was cool too you're learning a new technology i learned a new technology like i learned how to navigate you know just using maps and compass and like you know it, it's very you know and getting down to using maps on a scale of a hundred thousand when you realize that one square millimeter on that map covers a hundred meters on the ground and you're looking for a checkpoint that is right there you know in that in that kind of square space. And when you think about like how much that is, it's pretty interesting. Are you the driver or are you the navigator? Cause there's you know, two, two yeah. women participate, correct? Yes. We're a team of two. And the first year I, we traded off my partner and I, and so I was navigator and driver that year, um, pretty much half and half. And then the next two years I, I drove, um, I really wanted to push my driving skills since I was new to off-roading and, uh, wanted to, like, you know, my first year, my, my, partner was more experienced with driving. So she took on the more challenging parts of the rally. And I, you know, and I held back and, you know, didn't go in the dunes. And I told myself the next year, I really wanted to be able to conquer those dunes and go on the more technical, harder parts of the rally. So I looked for a partner that wanted to be a sole navigator. And so I got, you know, navigator. And then my next year, last year, I did it with my sister who was watching us the first two years. And the first year I did it, she just thought it was amazing and was like, oh, I need to do that. And I invited her to be my partner the next year, but she didn't, it, she didn't quite jump on then. And then this last year, I was like, you need to do this. You need to get away. She didn't feel like she'd get away from the family for that long. And, you know, then I was like, that's when you think that that's really true, that you can't get away, you really need to figure out how to get away. And <laughs> so I convinced her <laughs> and she, and so she took it on with, took a leap of faith and jumped in with me and you know, it really is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. It, it's hard to, I, I, I really going into it, like it was funny, they just recently kind of reflected on the first original rebels, they call us, that took did it the first time. And I had no idea, like when I was going into it, like how hard it was going to be. I really didn't think, I'm like, you're given the answers. You're, you know, you have the GPS coordinates, you're going to plot them on the map and you have to go find them. Like you're given the answers. We should be able to find the checkpoints. Well, that's not, that's not exactly how it goes at all. So um, it was just a big, le lots of life lessons, lots of life lessons. It's very, you know, you learn a lot about yourself. And when you learn a lot about yourself competing for 10 hours a day for seven days straight, it's very, you know, it's a big endurance, it's an endurance event, which, you know, and the, before I've done like triathlons, I've done a half Ironman. And the first day my, and my sister is a stronger competitor than I am physically. And she came back that first day and she's like, that's the hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> so it's a mental and physical challenge then. I, you know, it's physical and not, I mean, I wouldn't say super, it's definitely not super physical, but it is me like mentally. Yeah. Just a very, very okay. mental and, and your brain doesn't turn well, off. Well, and I don't think your brain doesn't turn off. I think for three weeks after you're still like, <laughs> you're still evaluating and analyze. I don't know, unless you're just, unless you're just like, no, maybe some people can really turn it off. But for me, I'm so analytical and like, you know, rethinking and revisiting like it doesn't turn off for like three weeks after. See, now it would be a physical challenge as well as a mental challenge if you were doing it in a series truck, John. Yes. True. Yeah, you know, and that's actually one of the things I would love to do one year is like enter with like a really like, you know, like, yeah, a series Land Rover. That would be amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, you can really make those tech free because you can, you know, you can hand crank them, run them without a battery. 
oh my god <laughs> yeah, that would be, yeah that would be definitely physically challenging on top of it all well it would certainly add difficulty factor for your for your navigator because you'd have to ha- have them out start in the vehicle and then, you know make sure you don't run them over you know the, things like that oh my gosh yeah yeah, yeah but, sure, but you sure would be certifiably you would be certifiably badass if you did that though you know that right well i you know i, I mean yeah, that would be that would be a, a whole other level. <laughs> so I, I do have a I actually have a lot of questions, and you've you've created even more questions as you've if you talked. But what? So what's a day like? Is it, and and I because you know we've talked to Emily, she's been on the show, told us about the Rebel yeah. Rally. But what is it? What's a day like for a competitor? Say in the middle of it, just just to get a sense of you're are you know, you're getting up at four a.m. You're getting up at six. Or, yeah. are Are you scarfing down a meal and then you're already thinking of where to go? Where do you go to the bathroom? Where do you eat? <laughs> no, I'm I'm serious because you know you're yeah, out, yeah. You, you're out in the desert typically, right? Yeah. And you're not yeah, around people. Well, yeah. what what's it? So what is like that day like? So a day is well. We'll start like you know in the morning so the cow you know she has a cowbell that she rings at 5 a.m in the morning i'm typically awake at 4 30 for whatever reason i can't sleep um you know and i and i go to, well i go to bed somewhat early so I, i'm in i tend to go nine ten o'clock to bed and we're in a tent we you bring your own tent so you and you self camp so i just bring a little pop-up tent but then we're also in a bigger t- a camp called the bivouac and that bivouac has all the services, like there's bathrooms and there's showers, and we have a caterer for breakfast, and um, then they pack us a lunch, and we have dinner. So we don't need to, we're self, you know, part of the event is that they're taking care of us on that front. Right. So that's, and that's really amazing. Um, I'm also lucky enough in my vehicle, I have, um, it's equipped with like juice gear, and I have an ARB refrigerator. So I have that loaded with like all my snacks and things to keep me happy on that front. So you know, we just have, you know, we have dark chocolate for mm. when we need it. We, I, I brought <laughs> Snacks brought, to keep you happy. Yeah. Well, this is California after all. So. <laughs> yeah, and I, I bring all kinds of like juices. I'm, I'm really big into it. Like I had like last year, I did all these Zupas like for vegetables and stuff, like just to keep everything going and um and water. I have a, I have a big thing of a uh, five gallon tank of water that we refill our, you know, swell bottles with. And then, you know, we put those in the refrigerator and, you know, use those for water and fluids. So then- uh, but then in, during the during the day, we're going to the bathroom just the same way the bears do, you know, like in the woods or sure. behind a tree or cactus. Or, and then, right on. yeah, and then, you know, we come back into camp, you know, midpoint during the day, you're either elated because between the seven days, they're, the days are designed, Emily designs them very strategically and very smart. Like, you know, they're designed to kind of go in this wave of like, you know, where it's going to get, you know, really, really hard. And like very hard and then just like, and then a little bit easier to find things and then a little harder, you know what I mean? Harder. So she gives, you know, you definitely have patterns of when you're finding everything and patterns that you're not finding anything <laughs> or, you you know, or you're lost, you know, just strategically, like for me on each one of the rebels, day four has been very, very hard. My first year that day four, we couldn't find any of our checkpoints in the morning before because uh, you have waypoints throughout the day. You have these green checkpoints that you have to make by a certain time. And if you don't make that green checkpoint by that cutoff time, you're done for the day and cannot score any more points. Oh, okay. So day to day, it is, and that, and then that's the other part. Like you're asking day to day, it's uber uber competitive. Every single team there is there to win. No one is there just to finish. I mean, I think there was maybe one team that's like, I'm just happy to be here. You know, like <laughs> there, no one there is just happy to be there. <laughs> like, and even them, they're like, everyone is trying to get, you know, score all day long. So it's very very competitive but in a very supportive, friendly way. Like everyone is very, very helpful. Um, as the teammates, we're allowed to help each other out. You know, if we're out, if someone's stuck, we're allowed to yank them out. Um, also, if they're stuck, sometimes, you know, you don't necessarily want to throw your day away or spend, it, you know, a lot of time management. You really have to, if you don't, if you spend too much time looking for a checkpoint in the morning, like on our day four, our first year, we spent way too much time on one checkpoint and had to, then, you know, just go back to the grain at the very end. We didn't get anything in the morning, not one score. And so that was devastating. Like, it just felt like such a failure, you know, that felt like I'd let people down. And, and then in the meantime, everyone's watching you at home because as you're checking in to those checkpoints, your scores are getting thrown up on the, you know, getting thrown up to your family and friends on the screen. So mm-hmm. they see you missing stuff or these, you know, they see you not getting anything. And I don't know, I think I'm so connected with my family and friends. And I know my husband is like watching every move and, um, <laughs> 
this last year he texted my phone the entire seven days. So for, I, so I could read all what he was thinking all week. And um, so, it, you know, you know that they're watching you and you want to, you know, you want to make them proud of you. And so, you know, it's, it's hard. It's, you know, I don't know how else to, to say it, except that it's really, really hard. So do you get in the morning, and I appreciate what you've told me, but do you get a list of, of four or five checkpoints and then you, you're, you're using uh, manual navigation, so using a compass and uh, to, to figure out where to go? Uh, is, is, that's the basics of your day, right? Well, the basics is, yeah, in the morning when we get up, um, depending on our start time, we line up to get our keys because our cars go into impound at night. So oh, there's okay. a couple of things we need to do in the morning. Uh, if we're moving camps, we have to also pack up our camp and then we have to wait in line and get our checkpoint list. And the checkpoint list is more than five checkpoints. It's about 20. I mean, it can be as many as 20, 25 checkpoints. Oh, wow. And the, and the checkpoints consist of a GPS coordinate or it could be a distance and a heading. Uh, then you take that checkpoint list and I bring it to my navigator. Either I pick it up or the navigator picks it up. We bring the maps. Um, we try to find a table with light, you know, at that time in the morning, it's really dark. Uh, this year it was 26 degrees in the morning and we were freezing and we're California girls. And like, that was just really, really cold. So we moved, we, you know, by the time we were allowed to go in the car, we moved, uh, my, I moved my sister and I, we got into the car and I turned the heat on this, you know, of course the luxury of the D4, I had like warm seats and I looked let the, you know, got the steering wheel warm. And then we were able to plot our points and we plot the checkpoints using it, using a ruler that is a, a scaled ruler. So you use the GPS decimals and then you're translating that GPS coordinate onto the map using that ruler and setting the point. And then if you, you have a distance and a heading, you're using a plotter to get the distance and the heading by getting the degrees and the location that way. So a checkpoint could be 263 degrees, a heading of six and a half miles, 263 degrees away from checkpoint seven. You know, so like you have a list and the checkpoints you go in order, you have to take them in order. So checkpoint one, checkpoint two, three, four, five, all the way down the list. Each checkpoint is a different type there. Well, there are three different types of checkpoints. You have a green checkpoint, which is like, like I said, it's like a station. It's a big, you know, it's a big green flag. You know, everyone's there. There's staff there. It's kind of, you know, and those are the ones that you need to get to by a certain closing time. And they tend to be easier to find. They're on like big road intersections or at like a landmark location or, you know, something pretty, you know, pretty basic. Uh, then we have a blue checkpoint, which is a marked, um, it could be a blue flag, which is like kind of, you know, like one of the, like a, you know, pretty big blue flag, or it could be a very small blue flag, or it could just be a simple blue, like PVC pipe pole that's stuck in the ground, which you know, can be, you know, it's not something necessarily you can find, like, you're not really supposed to find it. You're supposed to navigate to it by using the map and everything. Um, and then we have black checkpoints, which are completely not marked on the earth. They're just the GPS coordinate. And when you get there, you check in with your satellite tracker when you believe you are standing on the checkpoint. And then you have, if you score any of the checkpoints, you have like a 50 meter radius. So you have to find it within an accuracy of 50 meters to score points. So the black one, you just, you push the button hoping you're right. And if you're not, you're screwed. If you're not, you don't score. Correct. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You have one chance. Wow. So, um, okay. That's yeah, intense. Yeah. So when you think about it, like when you're, you know, and when you think about what 50 meters is and when you're looking at a map, that's a hundred scale map. And you think of one millimeter on the map, that distance on the map, your, your radius is half of that. Are, are those skills that you train for ahead of time then? Is that the, you referred to that earlier, I assume that, yeah. uh, that kind of dead reckoning, I don't even, what do you call that actually? <laughs> Speaking yeah, we of don't, it's not, not a lot of dead reckoning. Yeah. It's you no, know, cause, um, well that, you know, there is a rally that is dead reckoning. That's more about distance and you're scored on, um, not taking, you know, getting there in the shortest distance possible. But, um, this is not a dead reckoning competition. This is a navigation competition. So you just need to navigate there finding the best best path possible to get to that point by referring to the map. So you have you have the checkpoint on the map and then you're looking at your routes on the map to determine how you're going to get there. Cool. So the route you take isn't as important as just finding the right location. Yeah, the route is not as important you can but you can definitely make a big mistake like if you kind of dead sometimes like you think dead reckoning or like the shortest distance might be and that that can be like tricky. I think the first day last year um, there was a checkpoint that was literally 
just like kind of due north. The first checkpoint was like really just due north of our camp. And it looked like there was a trail that went right to it, right out of our camp, like just like the shortest distance. But then I looked at it really close and I was like, I told my sister, I go, this is a trick. There's no way. I said, we have to go. I'm like, we have to go west. And then we have to go north and go around that range. There's no way we're going to get through that. It doesn't look like that goes through. And when we put like the, we put our readers on like the magnifiers, like to look at it really closely and we couldn't see that trail get, get actually make it through to that checkpoint. And so, yeah, knew we went all the way around the range and came back through at it. And then I asked Emily later, I was like, you know, I'm, I don't think that trail went all the way through. She's like, no, it didn't. <laughs> I was like, ah, thank God. <laughs> so that was a test. I don't know. I mean, I don't know if anyone took it. You could kind of go back and look on the trackers and see if anyone went that way. Cause it did look to me, it looked like that. That, that was your first instinct when you, right. you know, you know, cause you're looking for the shortest distance. That's oh. your first, you know, obviously your first way you're going to look for something. Right. So it, it is easy to get lured into something that appears like a shortcut. Right. Or it feels like a, a straight line or something. Yeah. So, I mean, some of them are straight lines. Like some of them are simpler, you know, you know, some of the checkpoints are designed. Some of the checkpoints we have on the, the course are designed to move us along the course, not necessarily get, not necessarily be hard to find, you know what I mean? Because they're kind of right. designed, you know, cause she's got to get these 40 vehicles all the way down, you know, all the way down the, the course. Like she can't have people going all over the place, you know? So what is the course terrain like uh, is it, and it, because it, does it, it hasn't it changed in its locations, I believe. So what, what's that like? What kind of things are you encountering? <laughs> Rocks, stream oh. crossings? Uh... Yeah, we started with, um, you know, lots of like, like, you know, when we're up in Northern California, it's like lots of lush, beautiful, like landscape. We go through canyons. Uh, we go through when we're in, we done Johnson Valley for it. So there's, you know, definitely a lot of rock, you know, rock crawling things in Johnson Valley. And then uh, to like dunes and glamis and, you know, desert terrain. We've gone, you know, we've done the Mojave Trail. We've, you know, been on um, the back areas of like Western Nevada or is it Western, Western Nevada? Yeah. Western side of Nevada. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, the Like that area. So it's really a lot of variety um, and just beautiful. Like California is gorgeous. Nevada is mm -hmm. gorgeous. Um, it's so really surprising like what you see. And I think my sister, she, she's a beach gal and I, she hasn't really done a lot of the off-roading overlanding at all. And she was amazed with the serene scenery, my, my, all, like all my partners and, you know, everyone on it is just like, this is just gorgeous. And you really do take your time and like, look, look around and, and the course is designed to take you places that are just, that are amazing to see. Like that's part of, like that's part of the whole event. So it sounds like the types of terrain are varied enough that you would need all of the positions in your terrain response knob. Yes, I have used all the positions in my terrain response knob. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so I use the sand. I mean, I use the sand a lot, um, the sand setting, and then I go, you know, and I go into the rock setting, and yeah, and then I'm, I don't, I use low when I'm in, you know, I go into low when I'm in glamis, and for the most part, though, I'm in high, like the majority of the event is just like in Johnson Valley in some areas I drop in the low and then the vehicle has been really amazing. I haven't had any issues, which has been, yeah, really tremendous. Like no air suspension issues that, you know, that was one of the things that I'd heard that could fail on me out there. And, um, I'm, you know, I carry all kinds of extra parts with me in case something breaks. I have the guys from, uh, Jaguar and Land Rover and I'm Hills on their phone numbers on the box in case I need to call them from the mechanic, because we have to, um, also fix our own vehicles if something breaks. So that would be a huge challenge <laughs> for me if something broke. Um, but we've just been really lucky. So let's talk about the truck then. How did you get into, into Land Rovers? And we know that you didn't start with Land Rovers. How, how, how did that, how'd that come about? Yeah, it came about because we start, you know, we started off the grade rentals, which is a off-road, off-road camping company, overlanding company. We were doing jeeping in the Jeep and I needed a new daily driver and I wanted to join in on the fun of the overlanding and the trails and such. And we looked at the Land Rover and the Disco 4 and I was like, this is fantastic. This is a fantastic truck. And we took it to the Western National Land Rover Rally. From there, I met people there and, you know, just really got involved that way. And then that's how I got introduced to the Rebel Rally was through the people I met there. And that really launched everything um, out of the Rebel Rally. They also launched uh, Ladies Off-Road Network. So I've been involved with the women um, in off-roading in that regard. Uh, so yeah, that I mean, that's how we got started. And, you know, now my, you know, Land Rover, we have, 
I haven't done a lot of modifications to it. Like just, you know, bigger, you know, better tires. I have the Falcon wild peaks on there. I have the goose gear for, you know, organization and the fridge. And then I have a fantastic rack from Rhino rack, but that's, and then a con grill for looks. Cause I just wanted to change the grill, but it's just all stock. So I compete also in the, in the bone stock category with Land Rover, which I think out of most, most of the time with the Land Rover, that's unusual. Like most, mm -hmm. a lot of people have changed things suspension wise or changed things that don't make their cars qualify for bone stock. What kind of tires are you used to stock tires or do you, uh, for no, the Fal no I, Falcon wild peak, they've been sponsoring me. They've sponsored me the last three rallies. Did you have previous off-road experience with the Jeep or, or previous to owning the Jeep? Not, not a lot. Mm -hmm. no, I mean, maybe like some, you know, like uh, my husband had the, my husband primarily drove when he had the Jeep. So just no, not a lot at all. I learned how to off-road literally at a Rebel Rally training event that I went to, to learn about the Rebel Rally. Sweet. I drove my Land Rover about 10 feet before I got it stuck, like right away. Like I was really bad. <laughs> well, you know, get it out of your system before you need it. That's exactly right. I would, yeah. It was really embarrassing actually. I mean, I think back to that day very, very vividly and, you know, Emily had us like, okay, you're going to go up this dune. And I think I traveled about 20 feet before the vehicle just stopped and didn't go anywhere. So yeah, it was pretty embarrassing. Um, but I learned a lot about that vehicle. I learned, I mean, Emily's an extraordinary teacher and she just jumped in the vehicle with me. And, you know, that whole day I spent with her in the car and she showed me how to drive in the dunes. And I was like, this is amazing. And I just came back really pumped with, you know, really strong desire to, sharpen my skills in that regard and so i've that's what i've done over the last four years you you have nothing to apologize for by the way or be embarrassed about because <laughs> no I, I, the the fact that you that you've done this and just and did it and then and, and learned it after talking to emily on the show we call her badass and i think we need to oh she's beyond bad she's beyond badass <laughs> and, and I, I i think uh uh deborah is, is in the badass category also just just uh -huh. you did this you i it's just I, you know there's, there's not a lot of people do this kind of stuff to begin with but uh, you kind of jumped in uh it seems seemingly with both feet and well, Let's it's do a it. special kind of hardcore to just commit to doing this stuff with no experience whatsoever, figuring yeah. you'll learn it along the way. And that's yeah. that deserves a lot of respect. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, thank you. So, Thanks. Yeah, it's been um, it's been an awesome journey. Like I, you know, I just never, you know, I just yeah, I mean, I didn't know that I would get so interested in this. But now it's like the challenge now. And now when I go to Glamis, I feel like I'm one of the strong drivers. I'm super confident and get through it. But I'm, I still am like I still have like a great amount of I think healthy fear because I just you know of course the last thing I ever want to do is hurt That's someone important. in my vehicle or you know you know, do something really stupid. So no, that's that's actually very smart. I think that's a that's, that's a healthy concern. Does, does, and I think the most important thing you can know in any situation is what you don't know. Right, right. I have I have found in my experience the time when you get into your into the most trouble is when you think something is easy or the, yeah this isn't a problem. There's there's nothing here to worry about. Then right. then that that's when I've gotten and into you the trouble. Let your guard down. You let your yeah, guard down. And that, yeah, and that's true. And that's you know and fatigue on the rally is a lot. I mean this this last rally I coming down the dune I was we were a little bit we were shaking up. We couldn't figure out where anything was, and I just kind of like aggressively went down one dune and couldn't avoid this bush at the bottom. And I, I landed up taking out a front corner of my vehicle, but totally driver error. Like, it, yeah, it was, you know, so it was like one of the things I kind of was upset with myself over, but I had to just let it go and laugh about it. And the, everything was hanging out on the side. I had to zip tie up the <laughs> devices. I forgot what are the sensors, like the box sensors were like hanging mm -hmm. out. And I was like, oh, okay. And so, and then the last day of the rally, um, they allow a lot of media there. And one of the gals, that I know I'm like, Hey, take a picture of me zip tying this and send it to Nazar, my husband, and he's going to get a kick out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're, if you're zip tying stuff, it is a Land Rover then it's definitely a Land Rover. If you're, especially you're on the trail and you're zip tying. Yeah, that's. Well, I was going to suggest a hammer and duct tape are the two most important tools you can carry, but yeah, I zip ties are number three. I definitely have a hammer and I have duct tape and I, I mean, my crazy beaver shovel is gets a lot of use for mm -hmm. digging things out. This last rally surprisingly, like this was the last, this actually last rally was the first rally. Um, my sister and I did not need to use our mat our, our, well, you have treads, but I did not have to dig myself out ever. So that was pretty, I felt really strong about that. This first, the nice. first two rallies and actually our second rally, we were stuck for quite a bit, Amy and I, and I was, you know, we had a teammate come up and offer us a yank and Amy and I were like, Oh no, we got this. We can do this. And <laughs> I told myself this next rally, if someone offers me a yank, I am taking it Take next it. Yes. time. Right. Right. Wow. 
but um, yeah, we, you know, if you get stuck, like you're only allowed to have help from other teammates. You can't take any help from any outsiders. Uh, how often then do you typically get stuck or do not necessarily you, but participants in yeah. general? Is it almost, I would say like uh, this last rally was unusual that I didn't get stuck at all. My first rally, we were, st we got stuck maybe on day four, for sure. We got stuck in Dumont dunes, but it was quick. It was a quick, you know, we were a quick recovery. You know, we were able to put the max tracks under really quick and jump out. And then in Glamis a couple times, two or three times this year, we, Lori and I did get stuck in the dunes, but uh, Courtney came with her Jeep Wagoneer and she's like, do you want a yank? I'm like, yeah, give me a yank. <laughs> and so she pulled us out in a, a minute. It was, it was super fast. Like we literally got stuck and she was there within a second and it didn't take any time. But all, I would say almost all the competitors would probably tell you that they've been stuck. Right. Sometime or and, and a lot of competitors lose tires like, you know, you have oh, to yeah. change their tire. Oh, from from what, like a rock or uh, sliding. Yeah, or? I think um, I know that the first um, first day, uh, the Jeep team, the winners, actually, Emmy and Rebecca, they lost a tire. And she thought I think she thought that they hit barbed wire that on oh, something. Wow. And she yeah, they tore up the, the BFG on on the thing and they had to replace the tire and so then that was kind of stressful because that was day one and they had their spare so they in they didn't really it they didn't feel confident going out with the spare and they were lucky enough that there was another jeep team with the same size that had brought two spares and they were able to take uh, one of their spares okay. for the rest of the rally right oh nice nice yeah and it, did you so what what do you take with you in your in your kit do you take one spare tire do you have uh, uh, kind of parts are you taking because you mentioned about how you have to be your own mechanic. Um, I thought, do they, don't they have, uh, I thought they had some mechanics like on standby in the evening to kind of help out. Maybe that's not they the do. case anymore. They do. Yeah, they do. And you are allowed, um, you're allowed one hour of their time, okay. you know, and actually a lot of the, and they, and the mechanics they have actually do have a lot of experience at Land Rover because the Hoans have been really involved with the rallies and they have a lot of experience working on their cars. So, they know a lot, but if it goes past an hour, then you have to start call, like you have to do it either. Well, you use their time or if they don't know how to change something, you can call, you know, then you can call, call other people that know how to fix that car. So I bring the suspend, the rods, like the tire rods. I bring all my fluids. I bring the suspension arm. And I mean, those are my parts. And then my first year I carried two spares because I was, that was the thing I was really concerned about was losing a tire. And so I carried a spare underneath the vehicle. And then I also carried one on top on the roof rack. But the next year, I only brought one. And then this, yeah, both years, I've only brought one spare tire. But then I bring a toolkit, a basic toolkit, because, you know, in all honesty, like, there's not, I don't have a lot of skills with <laughs> fixing the car. So bringing a lot of tools that I don't know how to use is not going to be helpful to me. So um, I bring a basic toolkit, zip ties, like you said, zip ties. I have duct tape. I have, a, well, we have to have a fire extinguisher. I also bring a first aid kit. Um, which is required, but I bring a pretty hefty duty, um, good first aid kit right. um, with all the medications in case like we're sick or, you know, all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like extra, you know, like I said, supplies, like in case you, and we also have, um, you know, on some days, even if we're going to camp and not move camp, there was days that we had went, like, you know, really gusty winds in Glamis where she, you know, Emily told us that we should bring our sleeping gear or, you know, bring stuff into our car that in case we got so stuck in the sandstorm that we weren't able to get out of the bottom of the ditch, no one could get us that we might to be prepared to sleep out there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in case you get, you know, you get yourself in a situation where they can't get to you or, you know, whatnot, you need to be prepared to, you know, be there overnight or a day. Wow. Oh, have you had to do any field repairs or what's maybe the worst f field repair you've seen someone else have to do? Yeah, no, I have not had to do any, uh, except for the fact, except last year on the last day where I, you know, I tore off the, I tore off the tire flare and then tore off the bottom corner of the mupper where I had like the, you know, the components dangling. Mm -hmm. um, so I did have to zip tie those back up. So that's my worst like bush fix repair I've had to do. We've had, I know that there was in the, the second year, we had one team that was in the LR4 and she was having a lot of difficulty with her air suspension. Like it kept failing on her and just, you know, just going down, like just dropping the right. air suspension just kept dropping on her and she couldn't, re you know, having a hard time reset it. So they had to reset that. Well, there's been a couple crashes. The first year there was two crashes. What? There, you know, yeah. Uh, the, what the first year um, over the dunes, she nose darted over the dunes and oh. yeah, crashed. But she didn't total, and she stayed in the rally. The vehicle, she was able to fix the vehicle. Wow. And um, but the vehicle was considered totaled at the end of the rally. <laughs> and then, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but she was able to drive it the rest of the right. thing. Um, but yeah, and then and then they've lost engine. I know that one of the SUVs has lost an engine. 
the sugar high, she lost her suspension and they, they broke their suspension and that, wow. that took her out of the rally actually. So she, but she, cause they had to tow her in, she had to get outside assistance. So she was not able to finish with scoring and that was the first mm. year. So there's been a few, like, you know, like a handful, I would say like a handful of pretty, like, uh, I think, cause like the, I believe it was the, well, the Honda, I think the Honda last year or the year before that lost the engine that they didn't get to finish the rally. Mm. They weren't able to finish on day seven. If you make a mistake or, you know, if you go over a rock and like, you know, puncture something underneath and really cause like some severe damage, you definitely have a lot of opportunity. There's a lot of opportunity for stuff out there. I, I mean, we're, you know, all through Johnson Valley, that's OHV. Like there's a lot of obstacles with the whoops. Like you can definitely break things if, you know, if you're not driving, you know, or even if you are driving, well, there's a lot of opportunity for something to happen. I almost hit a cow on in year two. Like, <laughs> Wait a minute. Like, you, you've waited this long to tell us the yeah, story. A cow <laughs> literally jumped out of the road. I mean, I came around the, it was a hairpin turn through the mountains in Nevada and I turned through the thing and this black and white cow literally just jumped off the road. I, and I was like, Oh my God. Like, that was really like a few <laughs> seconds and we would have hit the cow. <laughs> yeah. My, my, look, if, if it's any consolation, my mother lives in the middle of uh, Illinois and they actually have hit a cow. So, yes. right. Yes. Like they, so, they, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it can thing. happen, right? Yep. When there's well, wild but, horses and there's, you know, there's, but, yeah. See, in Illinois, them. though, cows have the right of way. <laughs> oh, do <did> they? <laughs> well, not with a Cadillac. Cadillac, yeah, Cadillac has a right of way. It was, yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how fast are you Do, you, do you, are you typically going? Because are, are there times when you're are you like on a, on a normal paved road or is this mainly all – is this truly all off the, off the pave, pavement? We are – I mean, for the majority of the time, I, there is – there are sections that we end up being on pavement, on paved roads, because, mm -hmm. you know, obviously we have to move down on the marathon leg from day four to five. We're, we're on pavement. Um, but I'm – you know, one of the things – one of the things about this is that it is – it's not a race for time, but it is – a t like it is time management and you have to be moving quickly between these checkpoints if you want to get all of them or if you want you want to continue to score or right. you know or you don't need to return or you you're not forced to return before you go find them so that's been the biggest time management so i'm pushing speed as much as i can like the you know they give us a speed limit of i think it's what did they say it was 50 on like the dirt roads but sometimes like if you have like if it's nice flat dry lake bed then we try to like, you know i try to push the speed like you know, as much as possible especially if i can right but um sometimes my sister's like just go as fast as you like but the same time as if you go too fast and your navigator can't keep track of where you're going like you can mm -hmm. kind of mess yourself up that way too you right. know so um, the navigator needs to know where you are on the map at all times. Like she needs, you know, she needs to know exactly where you are. And so if you're kind of moving too quickly and not paying attention or, you know, start talking about something that's not relevant, you can quickly like not know where you are on the map. So uh, again, these things would not be a problem if you're doing it in a series truck. <laughs> it doesn't go yeah, fast. I don't know. I don't well, know number either. one, I they really... don't go fast. Number two, you won't be talking about anything. Yeah. Well, so that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing, well, we actually don't really talk about it. I mean, the first year, I think uh, my partner and I, we talked a little bit more, but the, the last two years, I feel like all 10 hours in the car is doing the rally, like not much else. Like you're just, you you're know, focused you're just on that. Yeah. You're constantly problem solving. You're constantly looking for headings. You're constantly, you know, tracking the terrain to the map and not, yeah, not doing much else. Like you don't even listen to music. A lot. Of, I remember uh, one of my friends asked me, she's like, I'll be a partner. I'll bring all the great tunes. And this. I'm like, ah, yeah, yeah. No, that's not, that's not what we're going to be doing. In not the that kind of rally. Yeah. yeah. It's a rally, not a road trip. Yeah. 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 No, it definitely is. Yeah. Well, yeah. So for... you're definitely like, you know, you're, you're constantly working on the rally the entire time. So for you, what has been the most challenging part of it? Because you've talked about a number of different things. And maybe has that challenge changed every year? I think for me, I mean, obviously, is just being, a, you know, just being better at navigating and yep. really kind of determining how, like, what landmarks are, you know, strong enough points to use for headings that you can draw yourself back on the map and triangulate. That's the trickiest part is really um, putting your eye on something visually and, you know, and, and determining with like 100% certainty that if you draw, you know, if, you know, you take a heading to that, that you know exactly what it is on the map accurately to be able to draw yourself onto the map. So that's, to me, is the skill that, you know, that we always like need to, you know, get better and better at and reading like the contour lines, reading what they're doing, uh, kind of measuring like uh, height and understanding, you know, really getting a good depth of like what's at, 
you know, where is 80 meters? Like how high is that up? How high is 150? How far is, you know, how far is six kilometers? Um, things like that. That, really that is a lost it. art. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody knows yeah. how to do that stuff anymore. Yeah. And I mean, but getting to do it and getting better and better at, and I feel that over the three years we've gotten better at, I, I'm a driver, but I, I do help with the navigation and I help my navigator. I'm not just like, you know, I'm not just driving and saying, where do we go? There are some teams that kind of have that relationship, but our relationship, my team relationships have always been like both of us working together and really like tr troubleshooting and problem solving together. So, um, I think that the biggest thing I had, you know, is, you know, being, uh, not being so prideful about my results and not, that's been the biggest learning lesson. And I think my first year, I really thought that things would, it wouldn't be as difficult as it was. I just really didn't, I just didn't think it would be as hard as it was at all. And then once I discovered how hard it was, I just wanted to get better at it. <laughs> there you go. The competitive <laughs> nature. Yeah. Or how often in a normal day are you seeing the other competitors? Are, are you, because I, 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 I get the impression in my head you're not next to each other, but you certainly there's usually another team or others nearby you. Uh, or do they release you in uh, at the, all at the same time in the morning? Or is it you know when you came in that's how you get released in the morning? I'm I'm looking right. for yeah, how. So when you come in at night, um, when you come in and check in your final checkpoint, you draw a number, and then that number determines your starting position for the next day. And the starting positions are two minutes apart. Now there. There's like one or two days that we all like, oh, well, I don't know if we did that last year. I think there was one year where we did all start at the same time, but that is not really the common way. Normally we start two minutes apart. So, and then your start order is determined when you come in the day before. And then when you're out there on the rally, yes, you definitely do see other teammates. You might like when you come on those green checkpoints, like you'll see two to three vehicles there, but there's two different groups that are given like a course, like let's say like the course is like a figure eight on the map. So half the teams will be assigned the top part of the eight or like, you know, like the okay. Eastern part of the figure eight or the, you know, or the Western part of the figure eight. So half the teams are in one section and the other, you know, are doing one part of the course and then working their way to that figure eight the next half of the day. And the other team are going the other way. So you do see other vehicles, but you definitely can't follow vehicles around, especially with the black checkpoints. And also you don't know where they are at, what they're going for, what part of the course, what group they're in. Sure, I mean, you can ask and a lot of, I mean, and you, and you know, a lot of teammates do share, but when we get out there and sometimes like, you know, it just depends on, you do build like kind of relationships with other teammates and there's, uh, you know, lots of teammates that, you know, I can go up to if we're trying to find something and, you know, go confer with them and go, I think this is this and this, and they might give some feedback and, um, other teammates that maybe not so much other team, not so much, like, you know, if you don't know them too well. So over the years, like I've gotten to know a few of them this last year, it was interesting. We had a lot of new people. So was, I told my sister, I'm like, wow, I don't like, there's a lot of people that I normally like, you know, I'm able to like confer with out here that I'm not seeing. And, you know, so, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, you definitely want to build relationships with all the rebels and like, um, cause it, you know, you, you want to build it. So when you go out there, if you do see them that you guys can, you know, kind of chat if you need to need right. some help or so, you there, know, or want, so you guys want are helping help. each other it's there's competition but you are there's still kind of a healthy competition i guess you're helping each it, other if you get i would say it's or, a really healthy competition yeah. it mm -hmm. is but it's still competing mm -hmm. the person in first place like i don't necessarily go up to and go hey can you tell me where you are because i don't feel like it's appropriate you know what i mean like right. for me to go ask them you know right. so it just depends you know it just depends yeah you kind of have to feel it out and how right. you know when you're when you're willing to ask for help or not and then like some i think uh, last year, there was a few times that there was vehicles that were stuck, but they were stuck in a, like in a very simple way that they'd be able to get themselves out. Mm -hmm. And um, we passed them and we gave them a sign up. Are you OK? Like, you know, no one's hurt, blah, blah, blah. Like, you don't need any help. And uh, a couple of them came back like, oh, like the old rebels aren't helping. And I was like, well, no, you, you didn't need my help because you can get yourself out of that. The goal is to compete. So it's a little bit of, you know, sometimes like if you can help someone really quickly and you know you're ahead of your day, then, you know, yeah, by all means. But if you're just helping just to stand there and point, you know, what they can do, like, you know, where to shovel to put your max tracks under, like that's a two person job. What advice would you give to someone thinking about competing in the Ravel rally in particular, but to off-roading and in this sort of way in general, like what, what kind of skills or preparation and maybe even vehicle type things to look for uh, might you, might you have to offer? Well, one, if you have a Land Rover and it's just like not, and it's only driving to the mall, is you've got to get it in the dirt. <laughs> like you're wasting your. You're See, we like you. Vehicle. We like you. That's perfect. We like you. There you go. <laughs> and you know, uh, it's you know, it does it does not like going just to the mall. It's very safe at the mall, but it's you know, it actually isn't as safe at the mall because 
I, the, my vehicle has gotten more dings on it and stuff I at know. the mall than it's, <laughs> than it's gotten out in the roads. Yep. But, um, one, those are called I'm, battle scars. Yeah, <laughs> no, um, actually it's funny cause I just lost a tire. Was it two days ago on Thursday or Friday night? Yeah. Um, and, but it was at my daughter's track meet. I think one of the kids, one of the high school kids stabbed it with a knife. So, oh, um, no. That, yeah. It was Bastard. Like, yeah, I came out and had no, you know, it's like I've got a big gash in my tire. Like if you have a Land Rover, just because you spent $80,000 on it doesn't mean that, you know, it, it still needs to go out in the dirt. Like it needs to go out there and ha have fun. And I, I would just say like, go and just take, you know, go for a day trip. Like if you're in Southern California and go out to India, there's like Box Canyon, which is beautiful. Just go drive through that. It's a super easy trail and just bring like some lunch and just go try it. Or, you know, if you don't, um, if you don't feel comfortable going by yourself, like reach out, there's lots of groups on Instagram and Facebook. You can look up, um, if you're a woman, like ladies off-road network, and you're interested in getting off-roading, like there's, um, a great network of women that are doing things all the time. Um, and if you're thinking about doing the rebel, I, I mean, and you want to do it, the, my best advice would be just to really just sign up and just decide to do it. And then you'll, you'll start preparing. Like, I mean, it's the same thing they say, if you want to, you know, if you want to be a triathlete or if you want to do a triathlon, the first step really is just registering. Like if you don't register and you just think you want to do it, it's hard to prepare for it. So don't like think I want to prepare for it and then I'll register. Register. Yeah, and then you prepare. just, you just need to sign up, go to the yeah. training, get stuck, and then yeah. you go from there. Yeah, exactly. So you have to get stuck within the first 30 feet, Harold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a competition there. Who could get stuck the quickest? But anyway. I think I win on that one. <laughs> well, hey, careful. There's always somebody else coming behind you gunning for your records. <laughs> oh, yes. That's very much the yes, case. I, yeah. I don't, yeah. So, you. Do, I mean, like I said, if you can go one, anyone can do. I think the vehicles that you have are, you know, most people have vehicles that are, a lot of women, a lot of people have like these SUVs that are four-wheel drive already. They're ready to go and they're fine. And they're totally appropriate to take on something like this. And but especially if you have a Land Rover and you haven't taken it, I'd really encourage you to sign up and do it. How did you get your Land Rover to the event? I know you trailered it, didn't you? You seem no, like a trailer type. No way. No, my <laughs> my Land Rover is my daily driver. So it, oh, is it? It is. Oh, yes, that's cool. Yes. It, yeah. So it's what I take my kids to football, cheer, dance. It's what you know we get all these kids around in day to day, and it's also what we adventure in down to Baja many times and we adventure with our company uh, off the grid rentals. So I drove my vehicle up to, um, up to the Lake Tahoe area and then took it back and drove it back from San Diego back to Orange County. Uh, did you buy it new? Is it, have you had it since new or did you pick up a used? No, one? I actually bought it used. So That's I bought it as a 2012 certified used and had 40,000 miles on it when I got it. And how many oh, miles? So it was just broken in. <laughs> yeah. It was just broken in, and now it has about 95,000. Oh, that's yeah. a good start. No, that's... Yeah. And, and if yeah. it's gone this long and you've not had significant issues, I think that bodes well. That's uh, that's good. And you're keeping it... You you tend to keep... You think you're going to keep it stock then for the most part? I am going to keep it stock. Yeah, I feel that... Right. Um, I, I feel like Land Rover did a fantastic job, I think, with everything and mm -hmm. what I've done with it. And I've taken it on some amazing dunes, and it doesn't need anything else. It's right. fine. Have you uh, looked at other Land Rover models, either past or present? So, because we're curious what you think of the Defender. Yeah. I want, I, okay, so not, not super closely. We did, um, my husband and I did look into buying like one of the imported Defenders and building it up. I think that if we were to do it because we're not lucky enough to have a home with lots of garages where we could have a collection of cars. But if we were to do the Defender, uh, we talked about it, that we'd probably have to do it like more bespoke style. Like I'd want it with air conditioning and um, yeah. yeah, and make it more luxury. Well, I, you know, as much as I would love to have it like, you know, old and stock, it just, you know, for us, we'd have to have it more of a functional vehicle. I just haven't gone there yet, but I, I really would like that. That's like one of my bucket lists. I would like to build out Defender for sure. And I'd like to take on the Rebel Rally. Well, you know, the lack of a garage really doesn't make any difference because the Defender doesn't fit in a garage. No, no, no it doesn't. <laughs> and plus, well, they look better sitting out front of your house. It increases the value right. of your home. Right. Well, and so we would have to like squeeze between all the, like the, yeah. So we have, we have like a three. Yeah. There's not, we'd have to get, I'd have to get rid of one vehicle. Like, so, cause we've got the Ram that we use and then we have the Jeep and then we have mine and I don't want to get rid of mine. It has, so well, I, I can tell you which one you need to get rid of. Oh yeah. The Jeep. <laughs> which is the Jeep for sure. Right. We're kind of biased. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, I understand. <laughs> Indeed. We just lost the engine on the Jeep, so it's actually well, not here. Well, there right you now. go. Perfect yeah. timing. Oh, it's good timing. Know, almost, good right? timing. 
Yeah, exactly. That's actually not a bad idea. Just <laughs> just sho- just shove it in off your property and toss a road flare on the front seat and walk away. <laughs> that's that's like, maybe you know what you're, the Senator you podcast might, does not endorse burning vehicles down. Some, you might be on to something. You might you know what maybe a defender is closer in my future than what I think. <laughs> <laughs> Although you you may be ripe for a brand new defender, the new defender. Coming I out. I'm really ready to like take that when it comes and look. Yeah. I'm really excited about that. I want to see. I, I mean, I know there's been lots of like discussion about whether it's authentic or not, but I'm excited to see what comes. Well, it's authentic or not, it might fit your lifestyle. Yeah, exactly, mm-hmm. exactly, exactly. So I think that that would be that would be exciting to be able to get one of those. Uh, do, what do you think of the new Disco Five? Or have you seen those? Uh, have any chance? I have. Yeah, I haven't driven it. That one doesn't excite me as much. Like it's you know, I I actually have a girlfriend that is in my neighborhood and I see her driving a lot and I'm like, no, I prefer, I, I prefer mine. I still prefer mine. We've You're been hearing that girl. We, and we've <laughs> been hearing that lately is that folks weren't really excited by the, say the, the discovery four as much, but they really like it now that they've seen it just go five. <laughs> and they're right. like, <laughs> so it's like, yeah, yeah, you don't, yeah. you don't really appreciate what you have until it's taken away from you. Until yeah. it was taken away. Right. Yeah. So now, and now I think like people are really like, you know, I, I see a lot more people going, Oh, I really appreciate like the disco, you know, like the look mm-hmm. of the disco three, the disco four, you know, right. and then now it's, yeah. Still, bo- know. still yeah. boxy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, it still has that, that, that upright and, and boxy feel to it. Yeah. I love the way the windows are. That actually, when I jumped into my, when I got in that vehicle and I was like, I felt like everything was so open. And even when I do the rebel, like just the openness of mm-hmm. the windows and how much view area I have in there that you don't get. I don't, you don't get in the Range Rover or the Disco 5. Mm-hmm. So I just like how I feel like I'm really in the outdoors when I'm in my vehicle. Uh, you you uh, may not know this. They're coming out with uh, a new uh, Evoke, the 2020, and I, I, they have cameras, you know, all around. And they're now going to have the ability for you to not get out of the vehicle <laughs> and see what's what obstacles there are by just, you know, by base, you can put them up on the screen inside the car. So I, I should put that on. I'm curious to see how that would do. So I'm, I'm, I'm putting you down as the person that should do that. <laughs> to go see, like try to take the Evoke on the Rebel. That yeah, take the Evoke on the Rebel. That, yeah. that would be yeah. fun. That I would think. be interesting. I, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I would definitely be down to take an evoke out on the rebel. I think it could be. I think it definitely could be done, and that would be fun with the cameras and stuff. Would be interesting. That would be interesting. I, I think they do that on a couple of the other vehicles, but not to the extent that where I think you can see all around the car. I think some of the n- newer Range Rovers have uh, like a camera on each side of the vehicle, but the, this one's going to have almost like a. They started with this invisible bonnet idea. They were going to. Uh, I think project something onto the windscreen and it looked like the bonnet wasn't there, but it seems like they've moved that to having it on in the dash uh, on the various screens inside. It, 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 yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. Really interesting technology. I'm kind of see what that would be like in the real world. I wonder this, what this like is... the cameras are on the front. The best thing I could see being nice to have cameras on the front or like for stuff coming up is when you're coming up out over like some high ridges and then need to, mm-hmm. you know, or you don't know right, quite the, the break over. Mm-hmm. That's tends to be where we, a lot of times I need to have like my co-driver jump out and, see what's in front of me there right. so that would be interesting to have yeah, that it kind, I, still think kind I, would still of, make her, I would still make her get out and go look <laughs> yeah i think it, it kind of takes away from the whole experience of doing the rebel to escape technology right if yeah. you take it all with you and you use it yeah i mean i think that you're I mean, well we're still using technology but since we're using the vehicle itself well right? we're right but we're, <laughs> we're trying to escape the computer world for a little right. bit yeah i don't know if i i mean i still think i would I don't know. You still need to look further than what the camera would have view. Like you need to see what's coming up for lines. Like, you know, you yeah. can, you can't just think about what's in front of you for 50, you know, 50 feet. Right. Like you need to know what else is ahead. So right. you still need to look further, especially, you know, the dunes, like I, you know, our, my driver goes and she gets me a line. That's like two deep. Like, you know, she figures out, we figure out a line together. That's like two dunes deep. The camera's not going to do that for me. Sometimes you just need to turn off the devices and use the force. Right. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, so what does your husband drive? Which one of those? The Ram and the Jeep. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. Perhaps not for long. Yeah, on the Jeep, I, I think but that maybe might... we, you know what? You guys really like actually put a really good idea. In that, so <laughs> maybe next time we talk. <laughs> <laughs> in, a, in a few weeks, I'll get an email. Look, new, new defenders is mine. Yeah. 
Click. Well, there's a really like, yeah, there's actually, yeah, there's actually probably a good reason for that. Yeah. Cause the, cause he is the old engine in that Jeep. I don't know if you want to hear about this, but um, Go ahead. to replace Not it, really. the V8, yeah, it's going to be a ton of money. So we might as well do the Defender, right? That's there you go. Might as well. Exactly. Yeah. You, you know, has he gotten the bug? Like, does he, do you have to keep him from getting into the, the, the uh, LR4 or? Uh, no, not so much. Okay. No, he, okay. yeah, no, he, he has a land, he has the, his Jeep that, and when we go, like a lot of times what happens is it's more of an argument about me take, well, we'll, t okay. So if I really want to drive and want to take a vehicle, then he kind of says, okay, we'll leave the Jeep back. I'm like, no, because then you're just going to drive my vehicle and I want to drive. So it's more an argument about us taking two <laughs> vehicles. Than, uh -huh. yeah. nice. Cause nice. you ain't letting him drive yours. No. Uh, yeah. I see how this and goes. I'm like, I like it. Yeah. I'm like, this is not, yeah, no. Yeah. So if I, Get your own car, pal. Yeah. So, or, and I just think we should just take two most of the time and he doesn't see that as being efficient. And, but like last time we went to Baja, we took two, we took the Jeep and we took the Rover and then we went to, uh St. George we took two and we've just been and now now my kids are like wanting to drive more too. So now it's like I'm trying to, you know, I like we go and they're like we're in this like really cool step and they're like, Mom, let me drive, let me drive. I'm like, nah. So anyway, we're gonna need, yeah, we're gonna have a whole fleet of vehicles here soon with because I got two kids coming up on 16. So and they have all got the bug to drive and do stuff. So yeah. It's yeah, we're all kind of fighting for seat time right now. All the more reason. See, oh, we're giving you more ammo so that you can go right. get a, defend, uh, a defender because you, you need like, more space. I think my son needs to learn how to, you know, all about that defender, too. So I think it'd be a good experience for do, him. Do you do like, you drive a stick? Do you know how to drive manual? I don't. Well, no. here's a, ah. another skill you're going to need. See, and this will get you no, another skill. No, we're just going to drop a V8 in there. And, make it. <laughs> <laughs> and an autumn. That we, we actually did. There, someone here in the Pittsburgh area did that. Uh, they She she had a... Uh, a North American spec defender and, and they made, she had them upgrade it, upgrade it, excuse me, change it to had, an automatic. She had them ruin it. Ruin it ruin to an automatic. It. I know. Yes. See, I think you guys would be really unhappy with me with how I do it. I, I definitely think, I don't know if I want to get into a stick shit. <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do. It's a, it, it, it is the, it is a greatest thing. It's fun. And it's also a great safety measure because they're, they're, they're easy they to advance. learn. Just, you, you can't let yourself get overwhelmed. You'll learn it in, in, 10, 15 minutes, and then you master it after a few hours. Especially it's in a Defender. not a big deal. Best, best one to learn in is probably a Defender. Uh, there are other, you know, some more modern cars out there that are very difficult, I think, to learn on. Defender would be hey, perfect. Do it in a Defender, and, and you can learn it in low range, but if you have the have a diesel or a diesel yeah. with a hand throttle, turn up the idle speed, and you won't even be using the right-hand pedal. You'll just be learning the clutch by itself, and yep. that's the best way to learn. Yeah. Well, I definitely would want to do diesel. I think. On the, oh yeah, the, there yeah. you go. That's the yeah. That's the All ticket. Right. That's the ticket. Uh, if, uh, you, five speed diesel. Everything's better it. with oh, diesel. It's wonderful. <laughs> Everything it is wonderful. Well, I would, yeah, I would just appreciate the yeah that you'd be better. <laughs> Sorry, we're <laughs> we'll spend your money easily, so it's no problem. <laughs> So how did you uh, get into the the business? You guys have this really cool business, which I wanted to hear more about with the with the teardrop. Is it the teardrop trailers? Teardrop trailers. Yes, yeah, so we have a company called Off the Grid Rentals, and um, we rent teardrop trailers out of Southern California and Arizona, and uh, St. George, Utah. Uh, they're basically like they're off road trailer uh, trailers. So and they're completely equipped with a double sized uh, bed inside and then there's a small kitchen area in the back and we have a 30 gallon water tank and then we also uh, rent rooftop tents so if you cool. are interested in going like for two three day I mean some actually some of my customers have taken them for 30 days 40 we've actually had one customer take it for 40 days so you can really go overlanding and these things and have you know have a, this a weekend getaway or you know a week-long trip and uh, so we start that's how we've got into well, first we got that Jeep. That's how we got into off-roading. But then we found these trailers and didn't want to, like we were talking about, not being able to store it. Um, you know, we're like, well, we can't store it. So let's just rent them out. And we partnered up with some awesome off-road shops, like really the best. I mean, the best, we're in the best off-road shops in the area. Mm -hmm. And uh, we rent them out of there. So we're, yes, it's pretty cool. Um, I get to, it's really fun to talk to my customers that call me and, you know, they, they all like to talk about their trips. So we talk about trips and where to go and I'll pull up the map where they're going and I'll be like, well, I've been here. You guys should check out this. And we do a little bit of that together and it's really fun. 
Do, Not, do you give a discount if it's being towed with a Land Rover? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we have a lot of discounts. Um, so the longer you rent from us, the more discounts you get. So, and then of course, if you know we want to arrange a discount for your listeners, we could do that too. No, oh, hey, there we go. Ooh, there show go. up at your lot with a center steer sticker on a Land Rover, and you'd give a discount. There we go. For sure, you can get thirty percent off. Okay. okay, there we go. You but heard you, it. But yeah. you got to have the center steer sticker on you there have to, have to qualify. Yeah, the center steer sticker on. Yeah. Sure. There, you there you go. Yep. Now we're now we're cooking. And we have yeah, we sure. have listeners in the California or just, area. Yeah, or take a picture. If you, well, because you're going to rent on your. Um, if you're going to rent, uh, right. then you're going to rent on my website. But if you send me a photo of your center steer sticker on your car, then I'll apply your discount. There we go. Look at that. You heard it here, folks. Wonderful. <laughs> That looks. Yeah, I, I when when I you started getting uh, talking to you by getting on the show and I saw that though, those were like that was really cool. I'm like that's neat because I've looked at some of those, just the idea and then renting them makes so much sense more than owning it because you know how often unless you're going out you know frequently it makes sense to to rent from somebody and just it's yeah just it really I mean I really think it does I yeah. mean um, you know you're just the cost of ownership is so high and right. um, you know and so I think that we you know we've got several customers that have rented from us like three, four, five times now um, that are just like, you know, regular customers. And, uh, you know, I talk to them and yeah, I'm really, you know, it's good. It's yeah, it's a good model. Do, 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 have you ever had any, anybody try to rent from you that doesn't know how to tow anything? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> uh, for sure. Um, the nice thing about these though, is they are so entry level as far as towing, cause they're only, you know, 2000 pounds. So we had customers that really didn't know how to do anything and super, you know, anxious, but, you know, appropriately afraid because they didn't have experience, but because of where we are, like, the, like we're in rebel off road in Laguna Hills and we're in saints off road in Glendora and Sierra expeditions in Mesa, Arizona. And then we're in Dixie off road in St. George, Utah. So we're in very established off road shops with guys that are really experienced. And so those, they take those customers under their wing and they just show them what to do. And it's, you know, it's not, it's something that, um, you know, now, like I've had some of my girlfriends and rebels and it, you know, I said, Hey, take these out. They're easy. They're, they're easy. And it's really a lot of fun and, you know, gives you and opens up some opportunities to do some more stuff. So if somebody was new to it, but it was a little bit afraid, they don't have to be because, because you and your people will show them a basic absolutely. trailering. Yeah, Good. absolutely. And it's like, like I said, it's so small and you're not, you know, really like if you're just taking it for a weekend, you're not going to get yourself in a situation that you're, um, you know, in like these hairpin turns are like, really, you're not, you know, most likely if you're new, that new to towing, you're not going to take it on some, you know, real crazy stuff. But our trailers have gone like on the Mojave trail and they've gone, you know, gone through Baja and like done some, you know, they definitely can take on like, you know, serious terrain if you want, you know, if that's what you want to do with them. Do they have sh uh, shocks on them or? I just know that they're built for off-road. I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't no, know no, that. No. Yeah. They definitely have like a little bit of a lift to, and then you're kind of a standard a landscape lift. trailer. Yeah, there's a yeah. lift and then we have heavy duty tires on them, but right. no, what it, it says that there is a suspension and I know we don't have the articulating hitch just because we don't, because the customers might not be as experienced and articulating hitch yeah. would be more dangerous for them. That's a good way to get into trouble if you don't know what you're yeah. doing. Yeah. So we don't have like, you know, cause sometimes when we're at the, um, we go to a lot of, the, we go to the off-road shows and stuff. So sometimes I get challenged on that. Like, why don't you, you're not really off, you know, you're not really off-road if you don't have an articulating hitch. And I'm like, no, these are, you know, rentals and a lot of people running these don't have experience in fact, they could get in a lot of trouble with the right. articulating right. hitch. Yeah. So if you wanted to learn more about the actual, uh, trailers that we rent, they're, they're so Cal teardrop. That's the brand of teardrop that we rent out. And between all the different teardrop companies, it's really the one that we found like to be the best one for this, you know, for this model. And and they're fully equipped with, with cooking equipment and everything. Yes. Yeah. And we even, and we even provide like utensils, like cooking utensils and uh, pans and some like you wow. know, kitchen stuff. So you don't need to, like we tell our customers, like you really need like your bedding and then like your food and like chairs and a table and that, you know, and your firewood and stuff. But as far as like your kitchen stuff, you don't need to bring that. There's this cool little sink that comes out like under it's underneath the mattress. And then you hook that up on the side and then you have like a water pump seat and you have access to 30 gallons of water. So, I mean, like you don't have like, you know, you're not getting the shower, you're not getting a bathroom. You know, you definitely have enough to. Yeah. Like, Showers yeah. are overrated. You can cook them. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, like a lot of us are like, oh, yeah, you know, like for a few days, you know, but then it's there's plenty bad. of places if you needed a shower, you could stop along the road places and go get a shower there if you need it. Does it come with the ARB fridge or is that an extra? That's an extra. So okay. we rent the ARB refrigerators mm -hmm. out too. We just found like some of our customers already have like uh, cooler systems that they want and, you know, want to use. So if this is like if you wanted an electrical fridge, so you're not dealing with ice. 
you know, we, we really enjoy them and we use those on our trips. And actually we have the fridges in the trailers and then we also have them in the back of our cars and we, you know, use the one in our cars for beverages and we use the ones in the trailers for food. Deborah, thanks very much for coming on the show and talking with us about the Rebel Rally and about your uh, LR4. Did you name it, by the way? A lot of people name their Land Rovers. I, we didn't ask that question. Do you need? Did you name I your... know. You know, I did not name my Land Rover. And it, I mean, my, my team name is Amada Adventure. So we tend to refer to it like my whole my whole team as Amada Adventure. So it, it's like, here comes Amada. So, but. <laughs> there you go. That works. All right. <laughs> Where, where do you fall on that? Because in America, it seems some uh, it's about seems like half the people like to name their Land Rover, and the other half don't. I guess you oh. you, you, do, uh, you do you. You know, I how I I just never. I don't know. Yeah, I don't. It, it, it's a vehicle. It's it's. Yeah. I mean, it, it it's a tool. I don't know. Yeah, it's not a member of the family. That it uh, is a teammate. Yeah, I do consider teammate. it part of my team. Yeah. but I'm not necessarily. You know, anthropomorphize. Did I say that right? Anthropomorphize it. You don't give it a, a face. Yeah. You know? No. Yeah. That's okay. No, I, 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 don't. I I'm not yeah. into naming. I'm not into naming my vehicles either. But I know there are some no? there are people okay. that do. Yeah. yeah I so know. Some and I do. feel like because I, I know a lot of the gals like they have their names on their like names and they're like, right. okay, Benny sad, Benny sad because I heard it. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, I don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, it, I don't know. It's yeah. okay. No, no, that's say hey, it's, 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 it's a tool like, for me. I'm right? not that, but, but I, I, I definitely not, doesn't mean I don't have a love for it or anything, but I just don't see it as, yeah, I just don't, I don't see any for it. Right. That's fine. It's my, it's my LR4. There you go. Where, yeah. and where can folks uh, find you, locate you to tr- keep track of your adventures? And I assume you'll be joining the rebel rally again next year. I am hoping to join the Rebel Rally next year. I need a partner, so if oh. someone is interested. You're, wait a minute, um, your sister's done? Is that it? She, I am trying. Okay, so Lori, I'm talking to you right now. You need to do it with me again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Lori, do you hear? Do you, are you listening, Lori? <laughs> Lori, well, come on. We still have things to go find. Yeah, I would love for her to jump on again and do it with me again. That would be my first choice. Good. And so hopefully we can get her to do it. I, uh, you know, she has, she has a very, you know, she has a, she has a lot going on with her career and she's got a company and stuff. So she's super busy. So it's hard for her to pull away, but we need to make her do it. Um, uh, we're behind you. We, yeah. su- we support you and Lori yeah. doing the rebel. Rally Lori, again. stop making excuses. Yeah. Get on board. <laughs> you only live once Lori, you ha- and, and your sister, how often does she do this? She does this every year. It's important to her. Lori, you should help her out, help your sister ah. out. This is, it's a wonderful thing that she's doing and she's, a, she's a good example to the rest of humanity to get out and, and, and enjoy the outdoors and use her skills. And she wants you to join her in that. In, in well, that uh, she's amazing. Not to mention that she's super talented and, and an amazing person competitor and like i would love for you know and she's just real and she's really good so what what she said Lori, what deborah just said there we go we 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 only listen to quality people and that's that's deborah deborah knows you so there you go it's all it's it's, Uh it's, it's, just do it i don't did did we do all right there uh deborah do we do okay i laid on too thick laid on too thick yeah no not not no pressure no pressure (laughs) (laughs) Where but, can, um, where can yeah, folks so we'll, find you we'll on? We'll see. Uh, yeah, we'll see. I, you know, I, yeah, we'll see how it goes. It, but I'm definitely, I'm not registered yet. But if you want to find out more about me, like you're asking, um, my Instagram is Omada Adventure, O M A D A Adventure, and I'll we'll have a link in the show notes of, with that. Okay, awesome. And is that is that the main place? Is there anything else? Yeah, no, that's pre- pretty much it. I mean, yeah. if you're interested in off the grid rentals, our website is rentoffthegrid.com, and you know, and then our Instagram for off the grid rentals is off the grid rentals, and you can follow all the stuff there and learn more about us there. Deborah, really appreciate you coming on the show. Appreciate you telling your story and talking about the Rebel Rally. Uh, I think pretty much it shows that you you're just like Emily. You're a badass. Oh my gosh. Thank you. That, yeah. you know, like drawing a comparison to that is like a huge honor. So thank you. But, and then yeah. thanks for having me. It's really cool to be here. Please keep us up to date on what you're doing and let I us will. know if Lori I joins will. you and again. Lori commits to being my partner. I'll update you that we're doing the Please. year four together. Lori commit. You got to commit Lori. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Yeah, I know she's listening. She's going to listen. <laughs> okay. We'll make her listen. <laughs> Lori, if you are listening to this point in the show and if you commit to joining Deborah again on the Rebel Rally, I will send you an a a for free, I will send you a center steer t-shirt. Ooh. Oh, now you have to do it, Lori. See, but she has to and and she and she's going to say she's committed. I need to hear that she's committed. 
Okay. <laughs> is that is a t-shirt incentive enough? I don't know. We'll find out. No, we're gonna we're gonna have to throw in some more. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, that's we're, we're gonna have to sweeten up the pot. <laughs> that's about as right now. It's about as best that's as what, I can that's do. That's all we can do. The rest yeah. is on you. No, I know it's on me. I gotta figure it out. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Well, well, awesome. well, when you when you I guys team it. up and next year, we'll have both of you back on the show next time. That would be great. Done. Yeah, she would love that. That's what we'll do. Cool. That's what we'll do. Good luck, Deborah, getting Lori to join you again on the Rebel Rally. We were so pleased to have you on the show. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. And that's the Center Steer Podcast for February 2019. I want to thank our guest this month, Deborah Najum. And she has so nice enough to hang around for the closing of the show. Thanks, Deborah, for coming on again. Oh, thank you for having me. It's really has been fun to talk about all of my adventures. It makes me want to go back. So thank you for having me. You're quite welcome, even though folks just heard you like 30 seconds ago. <laughs> but of course, in our world, it was like, you know, 10 minutes ago, but it's kind of funny. It's <laughs> like so 10 minutes ago. <laughs> right, like, right, right. Everything's changed. Also want to thank uh, Abel Rovertor for helping us out, uh, helping support the show through the selling of his Range Rover Classic winches. He's over in California, by the way, Deborah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's a he's an interesting guy. Um, well, every Land Rover person's interesting, aren't they? So, right. And also, thanks to the One True Packs for his continued production support. And you can visit our website, centersteer.com. That's C-E-N-T-R-E dot com uh, to listen to previous shows and for show notes, which have links to stories discussed in today's show, including links to Deborah's information. You can track her down. We are part of the 4x4 Radio Network, and I invite you to check out the other 4x4-related shows at 4x4radionetwork.com. I, there's actually a Toyota podcast where we could learn about Toyotas. <laughs> we talked about if one wanted to do such a thing. Yeah, why uh, would you do that? Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. We, we were in, during the news. We were kind of comparing them to. There was a c- comparison to uh, Land Rover and. Uh, Anyway, we, we weren't sure of the details. Yeah. So there, there's also a show for 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 that J word that we don't say. Yes, exactly oh. for the jeeps. It's a, no, we say the J word. It's okay. There's no 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 hate. No hate on the other. Not way. never in mixed company though. No, exactly. <laughs> okay. There was you know at uh, at the at the I forgot to mention this at the main winter romp. Someone in fact did have a actual Willie's Jeep there functioning and on the trail. It was really cool. Uh, but see, uh-huh. the, the, that gets a pass because that's not a Jeep. That's a Willie's. That was a right. yeah. Yeah. Me, that's more authentic. And of course, I had to tell them, hey, I'm from Pittsburgh. You know where Willie started? Butler, PA, you know. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, dude, check your history. Actually, the Willies didn't start there. The Bantam did. But yeah. Bantam, that was it. Thank you. Oh, Bantam and the Willies. Yeah, thank you. You're right. Uh, you can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can directly support the show at patreon.com slash center steer. If you're not a subscriber to the show, please do so so you get the show automatically. Uh, so it shows up in your feed, especially if you're going to be traveling for a holiday or maybe you're traveling for work. Just automatically show up. You don't have to think about it. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed show number 71. We'd love to hear from you and what you're up to in your Land Rover. Like if you're doing the Rebel Rally, perchance. Right, Lori? Lori, you're doing the Rebel Rally again, right? Yes, Lori, you're doing the Rebel. <laughs> Until next time, I ask you to share the show with one other Land Rover enthusiast. And you may now resume your important things. Lori, commit.